Will the Committee on Zoning and Planning please come to order? Those wishing to present oral testimony in front of the Committee this morning, if you have not already submitted your registration form to our Committee Clerk seated to my right, please do so at this time. Otherwise, please raise your hand indicating your desire to speak at the time I call for additional speakers. Speakers will be limited to a one-minute presentation on all items before the Committee this morning. Written testimonies, including the testifier's address, email address, phone number, and other contact information may be posted by the City Clerk and available to the public on the City's DocuShare website. As a courtesy, I'd like to ask that all cell phones and electronic devices please either be turned off or placed on silent mode for the duration of this morning's hearing. I'd like to thank Committee Vice Chair Harimoto and Council Members Kobayashi and Menor for helping us make quorum this morning. Members, are there any objections to approving the minutes of the July 24th meeting of the Committee on Zoning and Planning as circulated? If there are no objections, the minutes are hereby approved. Agenda item number one, resolution 14-183, confirming the appointment of Wilfred A. Chang to the Planning Commission for a term expiring on June 30, 2019. Mr. Chang? Good morning, Chair Anderson, Council Members. Good morning. Thank you for consideration of my um, appointment. Uh, my name is Wilfred Chang. Um, if, um, I'm open to any questions at this time. Uh, anything else you'd like to add, Mr. Chang? Um, my name is Wilfred Chang. I'm a lifelong resident of Oahu. I currently reside in Pro City. And um, you know, basically, I'm honored to uh, receive this appointment. I would like to serve in the, the best capacity as possible. Um, you know, I just want to participate in, in the process and, and abide by all the laws that governs this commission. Thank you very much, Mr. Chang, for your willingness to serve. I really also appreciate uh, the opportunity you afforded me to talk story with you the other day uh, regarding your desire and willingness to serve. Uh, members, any questions for Mr. Chang? Thank you very much, Mr. Chang. Thank you. Director Otto, did you have any remarks you'd like to make in regards to the appointment? No? Okay. Thank you, Director. We do not have any registered testifiers on the confirmation of Mr. Chang to the Planning Commission. Is there anyone here with us this morning who would like to offer testimony? If not, members, the Chair recommends that Resolution 14-183 be reported out for adoption by the full Council. Any discussion on the Chair's recommendation? Chair. Council Member Menor. I just want to say that I support your uh, recommendation. Uh, I've known uh, Mr. Chang in various capacities. I've come to respect him, and I think he's very qualified, and I, I appreciate his willingness to serve. So uh, you have my full support for this resolution. Thank you, Council Member Menor. Members, any further discussion on Resolution 14-183? Okay. Okay. If not, any objections? Any reservations? Hearing none, Resolution 14-183 has been reported out for adoption by the full Council. Congratulations, Mr. Chang. We look forward to seeing you at the next Council meeting. Okay. Members, that takes us to Agenda Item Number 2. Resolution 14-184, confirming the appointment of Frank J. Lyon to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a term expiring on June 30, 2019. Good morning, Mr. Lyon. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. I look forward to serving the city, community, and mahalo. Okay. Members, any questions for Mr. Lyon? Okay. Mr. Lyon, I'd like to thank you as well for the opportunity that you afforded me to talk story with you about your willingness to serve your background and uh, look forward to moving your nomination out to the full council. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, anyone with the administration want to offer any comments uh, regarding the appointment of Mr. Lyon? Okay. We do not have any registered testifiers for resolution 14-184. Is there anyone here with us this morning who would like to offer testimony on resolution 14-184 on the confirmation of Frank J. Lyon to the Zoning Board of Appeals? If not, the Chair recommends that Resolution 14-184 be reported out for adoption. Thank you. Any discussion? 
Any objections or reservations? Hearing none, so ordered. Resolution 14-184 has been reported out to the full council. Congratulations, Mr. Lyon. We look forward to seeing you at the next council meeting. Members, the next item on our agenda this morning is Resolution 14-198, accepting gifts valued at $15,000 from several sponsors for the 2014 Housing Summit to be held on September 16th at the Neil S. Blaisdell Center. Director Otto, would you come forward, please? Good morning, Director. Uh, good, good morning, Chair Anderson, uh, Council Members. Um, yeah, this resolution is basically part of a, uh, there's going to be a housing summit on September 16th that the city is a co-sponsor with, and so this uh, allows us to accept donations to uh, pay for the, uh, some of the expenses for, uh, of the conference. And uh, we've had uh, a lot of interest on, on this housing summit, and so, you know, we ask for your support in passing this res resolution. Thank you. Members, any questions for the director? Thank you very much, Director. We have two registered testifiers, David R. Call, followed by Arvid Youngquist. And Mr. Chair, uh, Dave R. Call, we'd stand on our written testimony. Okay, we, and we've received that. Thank you very much, Mr. R. Call. And invite the council to the open testimony. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. R. Call. Arvid Youngquist. Chair Anderson, members of the Zoning Committee, my name is Arvid Youngquist. On Resolution 14-198, acceptance of gifts for the 2014 Housing Summit, uh, the modest amount of $15,000, modest but yet enough to respect it. And the future date of September the 16th, of course, would meet with the approval of someone that had really strict standards, Barbara Marshall. So I recommend that the committee approve and recommend it to the full council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Youngquist. Members, any questions for Mr. Youngquist? Thank you. There are no other registered testifiers on resolution 14-198. Is there anyone else here with us this morning that would like to testify on this resolution? Please come forward. I go to Good morning. Hi. Um. Then the. Then the. The movie. I just. I have one more question. Now, this is how you summon. Is. Is the summon going to address the homeless community? Is he gonna is he gonna address homelessness? Is it gonna benefit the homelessness? Is the housing summit going to address homelessness? The housing summit uh, homelessness will be discussed. There will also be other items uh, that will be discussed by the Department of Planning and Permitting in conjunction with the Land Use Research Foundation. And there are other panelists, I'm told, that are going to be present as well, but I don't know who all of the other panelists are. What the... But LERF will be represented as well the Department of Planning and Permitting. What the homeless issue will be addressed? Homelessness will be discussed, yes. It okay, will be. And I I think what he means is will the homeless be invited? Will they be allowed to participate? Folks will be in, folks will be able to participate in the meeting. Yes. It is an open forum. So it's an open forum. I can't tell you if it's an open forum or not, but people will be people will be able to to attend. And if anyone has any questions, uh, I would address those questions to the director of the Department of Planning and Permitting. My, my dad had a stroke. I just... Thank you. Director Atta, did you want to uh, offer any further remarks on the summit? Yeah. 
the only I, I th thing that I want to say, uh, homelessness will be uh, part of the agenda. Yes. And then uh, also the, um, uh, uh, there'll be, uh, uh, you know, the housing directors and, plan and uh, directors from the neighboring uh, islands as well. So it's not just Honolulu related. It is a very uh, comprehensive agenda. No, I'm aware of that, uh, yeah. Director. I, I'm just not sure who the other uh, uh, panelists are. I know the Department of Planning and Permitting as well as the Land Use Research Foundation. Well, I think uh, Kathy Sokogawa we'll has there. been closer we'll be in the agenda, and I, and Mr. Arakawa from, uh, from LURF has also been closer in setting the agenda for the for the. So maybe Kathy can. Ms. Sokogawa, if anyone has any questions in regards to the summit, would you? Uh, could you provide uh, contact information where people can send questions and receive answers? Certainly, and the room is, uh, I think the maximum capacity is 300. So that would be the limiting factor in terms of how many people we can accommodate. Sure. Okay, but uh, yeah. Ms. Okugawa, can you, can you provide a, a contact information where folks would be able to submit questions and receive answers? Uh, yeah, I, I, I would defer to the Land Use Research Foundation. We're participating in formulating the agenda, the logistics, mm -hmm. um, as well as the program. But for now, they are the lead on the program Understand. itself. Uh, Mr. Arakawa, would you be able to provide the committee with uh, contact information in the event the, the public, the committee, or our staff have questions in regards to the agenda? Yes, we've, um, as you know, we've talked to the council about this, yes. this summit. And uh, our phone number is 521-4717, 521-4717. But the notice will be going out in a week or so. Uh, because of the nature of the homeless issue, we were looking at uh, partnering with others to prepare a whole nother summit specifically on the homeless. And um, while, while the director is correct that homelessness will be touched on, it's going to be touched on, uh, you know, not as in-depth as a future homeless summit, which we are uh, looking to plan further. So um, this is going to be the housing directors, state and county housing directors, talking about market and affordable uh, for sale and rentals, basically. And the homeless issue we decided was so huge and uh, needed different experts that we're looking at doing another uh, summit sometime in the future within the next couple months before the uh, legislative session, before the legislative session just on homelessness and the solutions uh, relating to homelessness. Okay. Mr. Arakawa, thank you very much. Members, any questions for Mr. Arakawa or for the department? So Council Member Menor. Yes, uh, I would like to point out, though, that um, the issue of affordable housing has a, an important bearing and relationship to homelessness given the fact that, that we don't have here on this island or throughout the state of Hawaii truly affordable housing. So I'm looking forward to this affordable housing summit to the extent that I'm hoping that what will come out of it are really truly meaningful, bold and effective solutions so that more truly affordable housing can be built. And if we accomplish that, then that could also uh, at least indirectly address the homeless issue on this island. So exactly. I'm looking forward to the, to the dialogue. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Menor. Uh, Vice Chair Harimoto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to confirm. I heard. I, I believe I heard the date was September 16. Okay. So I think that's going to preclude most of the council members from attending because that is a committee meeting day. So just wanted to point that out. It's an all day. It's an all day event with nine separate panels just on those issues, affordable housing, you know, the housing directors uh, across the state. Um, and so that's why it was such a full agenda. Uh, you know, we'll have materials available for the public and for you folks, and, and uh, invitations will go out to council members. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I, um, I just wanted to point out, it's <coughs> unfortunate that it's scheduled on a day when we cannot be there. So thank you. Yeah. Well, um, council members are participating uh, in the in the summit, and you can drop by any time. Then we'd have to skip our own meeting. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> Sorry about that. Room availability wasn't on purpose. Members, any uh, f uh, further questions for Mr. Arakawa or for the department? I think I would just like to ask if maybe Mr. Arakawa could also explain that he's trying to document everything. So if you miss the summit, yes. there'll be a manual that you that'll be a takeaway from the uh, actual summit. If you can't be there in person, there'll be full documentation of all the panelists. Every panelist will prepare a, their notes of their presentation, and we're going to compile that and have that available to not only you folks, but the public. So 
you know, all their bullet points, whatever they're going to say, in fact, more than what they're going to say, because some of them only have five minutes to talk, but they'll have a, a few pages of, of their testimony. So um, all of that written material will be available. And I, I do appreciate that, and I don't want to belabor the point, but it's just unfortunate that such an important topic that the council needs to be involved with is scheduled on a day when we cannot be there. So, Oh, no, the, the council will have ample opportunity. I, I assume that there'll be, first, this is just the first of, of many, I think. So you'll have the opportunity to talk to everybody who speaks at, at that summit, especially at, if you're the next senator uh, for the district, for my district. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. Members, any further questions for Mr. Arakawa or for the Department of Planning and Permitting? Thank you very much. Sir, you'd, had, you'd like to offer testimony? Yes, please. Please do. Um, my name is Levi Landis. Good morning. Um, I was just wondering, the 15 grand that's being donated for um, summit expenses, honestly, if it were me, I would take that 15 grand and put it towards the actual housing rather than the expenses to talk about housing. Okay. Thank you. So noted. Is there anyone else who would like to testify on Resolution 14-198 who has not already given testimony? Okay. If not, members, the Chair recommends that Resolution 14-198 be reported out for adoption. Any discussion? No discussion, any objections? Okay. Yeah. And members, the chair also recommends a resolution 14-198 uh, be amended to a CD1 to include uh, departmental communication 635 in the fourth whereas paragraph. And that is in your binders, members. Okay, is there any discussion on the amendment to a CD1? If there's no discussion, are there any objections or reservations? Okay, the resolution has been amended to the CD1, as just mentioned. Uh, finally, the chair will recommend that resolution 14-198 CD1 be reported out for adoption. Any discussion, objections, reservations? Hearing none, resolution 14-198 CD1 has been reported out for adoption. Next item on our agenda this morning is Resolution 14-180, requesting the Department of Planning and Permitting to form a Citizens Advisory Committee for the Urban Honolulu Public View Study and Thomas Square Blaisdell Culture and Arts Neighborhood Plan. Director Atta for the administration. Chair Anderson, members of the committee. Uh, Good morning. Uh, George Arthur, uh, Department of uh, Planning and Permitting. And uh, with me is uh, Michelle, uh, Michelle Nicota, the Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we, we uh, don't have any uh, uh, objections to the uh, resolution as, as it is, but just wanted to clarify some things because it, the res resolution seems to combine three different uh, planning efforts that the city is engaged in. And uh, you know, I wanted uh, Director Nakota to explain parts of uh, the, the existing citizens advisory uh, task forces and things that are already in place. Good morning, uh, Chair Anderson and Council Members. Uh, my name is Michelle Nicota, Director of Parks and Recreation. I just wanted to uh, report to you that we are already in the beginning stages of forming um, an, a Citizen Advisory Board for Thomas Square Blaisdell Arts and Cultural um, Board. And so, yeah, so we've uh, and we actually had some preliminary me uh, meetings with some stakeholders, and then the uh, resolution we note uh, includes the uh, view study as so the, uh, the view study is is also another study, but it's the context of it, it includes Thomas Square and Blazo Center, but ha has a broader context of urban Honolulu. So that's a a separate but related. Uh, a contract that we're working working on. So, in terms of this uh, resolution, we weren't sh quite sure if it's a 
the resolution is requesting that we get a comprehensive one that includes all three or, uh, you know, whether we should, uh, you know, how we would break up the existing uh, uh, stakeholders groups that we've already formed for these uh, MBC and Thomas Square. So it's just a point of um, clarification. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Members, any questions for the administration? Good morning, Council Member Fukunaga. Good morning. Thank you very much, Council Member Anderson. Um, thank you uh, for the comments from the department. You know, the uh, original intent was really to uh, address the um, the joint effort by HCDA and Department of Planning and Permitting to incorporate a wider range of community um, input mm -hmm. in areas that uh, dealt with the view planes as well as that that overall study that will affect the Kaka'ako area. At the same time, um, not necessarily you know intending to disrupt or otherwise um, um, impact the existing Blaisdell planning process. The idea was that if we're going to be looking at you know some really um, innovative uses for that Blaisdell site, then perhaps some of the thinking that goes into that project can also be incorporated in the broader DPP HCDA type of effort. So it's it's intended to complement, mm -hmm. not um, you know disturb the existing process, but to really make the best use of um, the city's planning efforts in utilizing and including community input and um, perspectives early on, rather than you know at the tail end of the process. Okay, well, I, I think I, I understand. Yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Fukunaga. Members, any questions for the either of the directors of either of Parks and Recreation or Department of Planning and Permitting? Thank you very much. Thank you. We do not have any registered testifiers for Resolution 14-180. Is there anyone here this morning who would like to offer testimony? Mr. Youngquist, please come forward. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Anderson, members of the Zoning Committee, and uh, Council Member Carol Fukunaga. Um, I only mentioned, I think she's not a member of this committee, but her expertise in the subject matter in the uh, vicinity of the subject, the resolution is going to be invaluable. I personally would like to urge that the uh, two departments that spoke to you just now uh, include in the stakeholders not just in the discussion but in the citizens advisory committee at least the minimum of the uh, chairmanship of the Makiki neighborhood board and the Alamoana neighborhood board and if you want to contemplate including the Waikiki I think that's up to you but I think that's a little bit more than you probably w meant and having this resolution um, considered for action today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Youngquist. Members, any questions for Mr. Youngquist? Yeah, thank you very much. Is there anyone else here who has not testified on Resolution 14-180 who would like to do so? Please come forward. I'm Michael Daly. I'm a, um, I was a supporter of uh, the Occupy, which camped at Thomas Square. Um, I'm also a supporter of Hawaiian independence, and Thomas Square has significant uh, historic and contemporary value with regard to the Hawaiian independence movement. And um, let me explain that. Um, the Kingdom of Hawaii was restored on that site in July, I think it was 1843, when the United Kingdom overthrew, or actually, that's probably not the right way of phrasing it, but they took control of Hawaii on, on the um, auspices of, of one particular um, military um, Admiral, and um, it was found to be improper, and um, 
the United Kingdom did the right thing, restored the, the Hawaiian Kingdom back to King Kamehameha III. So it's particularly of interest too to uh, Kanakanup Maoli. Uh, I don't speak for them, but uh, I, I would bring it to your attention that the site is part of an apua'a from the mountain to the ocean, and that uh, their cultural significance in the area has to be respected above and beyond anything else. I know that the Honolulu Museum is there, which is a state and US funded organization, which is part of the issue of the uh, illegal military occupation of Hawaii today. So my point is that um, with any moving forward on any cultural and art um, issues regarding the Thomas Square area, uh, that you include, uh, that you reach out and actually have them lead Hawaiian independence uh, interested parties. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions for Mr. Daly? Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here with us this morning who'd like to offer testimony on resolution 14-180? Yeah. Good morning. Please proceed. Good morning. My name is Lancelot Taili Lincoln. I am a direct descendant of Kamehameha One. And I recommend that you include Hawaiians in this decision and also have Hawaiians on that board that you, you are going to put together for this decision making of Tommy Square. It's a very important place for our people. I used to swim in that pond there when I was a child. So please make sure that our people are involved with all of these decisions. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Members, any questions? If not, is there anyone else with us who'd like to testify on resolution 14-180 who has not? The chair recommends that resolution 14-180 be reported out for adoption. Councilmember Fukunaga, did you have any final remarks you'd like to make on the resolution? Thank you very much for um, hearing this resolution. I do know that um, a number of Ala Moana and Kaka'ako residents had uh, sought to submit their testimonies. I did not see them in the, um, the stack here, but I will make sure that their testimonies are provided to the committee as well. Um, they are seeking, you know, to have um, uh, the city's processes, you know, really utilized to the fullest. So I appreciate your uh, consideration. Thank you, Councilmember Fukunaga. Hey, members, any discussion? If not, any objections or reservations? Hearing none, Resolution 14-180 has been reported out of committee for adoption by the full council. The next item on our agenda is Resolution 14-71, approving the IAIR Pearl City Neighborhood Transit Oriented Development, or TOD, plan. Would the city's TOD Administrator Harrison Rue and the Department of Planning and Permitting Director George Otta please come forward? Uh, Vice Chair Harimoto, is, uh, you're the council member of the IAIR Pearl City area and you've also taken the lead on TOD for the council. Do you have any remarks you'd like to offer before the administration makes their presentation? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, just very briefly. So this plan has been in the works for a number of years, and uh, the community does support it. Um, I think it's a great plan. We haven't heard any real objections from the community. Uh, I did want to commend the department for their um, outstanding work over many years to pull this together. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Harimoto. Gentlemen, please proceed. Thank you, uh, Chair Anderson and committee members. Uh, just we're not doing a, a PowerPoint presentation or anything today you've seen the plan we, yeah. we met you at the, went over the executive summary at the last meeting and gave you the highlights uh, talked a, a lot about the community input that we've had so far mentioned that we've got several pages of exactly how we have responded to the public comments uh, at our last meeting and so we agree with uh, Councilmember Hiramoto that the public's voice has been heard it's been incorporated in the plan and we have strong support at all the meetings that we've had with them this year and prior year so we uh, we recommend moving forward with it and ready to answer any questions members any questions for mr rue or for director otto okay 
Thank you very much, gentlemen. There are no registered testifiers, but is there anyone here with us this morning who'd like to testify? Please proceed. And um, if we wanted to take a look at Mr. Youngquist, if you could just come forward to present your testimony afterwards. Sorry, once Go again, ahead. my name is Levi Landis. If we wanted to take a look at those plans for the the TOD plans, and because I wasn't here for the PowerPoint presentation on the last meetings, the previous discussions on the subject. If you wanted to take a look at those plans, is there a website that we can go to? Or is there some way for to take a look at those plans? Uh, they're all available at uh, www.todhonolulu.org. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Youngquist. Chair Anderson, members of the Zoning Committee, and Council Member Fukunaga. My name is Arvid Youngquist. I voiced some concerns at the July meeting, and since this is for action and it's prior to the upcoming possibility of executive session this morning, I just keep coming up. Uh, two points. Uh, my wife and I visited the new IAEA library up the hill and we're quite pleased and we noticed uh, beyond the parking lot up the hill and the walkway a nice subdivision i want to make sure that that's included in the todd plan uh it's an ongoing thing and why not take credit for it thank you thank you members any questions for mr youngquist is there anyone else here with us who'd like to testify in resolution 14 sep Dash 71, who is not? Members, the chair recommends that resolution 14 71 be reported out for adoption. Uh, Councilmember Harimoto, did you have any final remarks? Okay. Any discussion, members? No discussion. Any objections or reservations? Hearing none, so ordered. Resolution 14-71 has been reported out for adoption by the full council. The next item on our agenda is Bill 49, rezoning land situated at Lualualei Valley, Oahu, from Ag 1, Restricted Agricultural District, to Ag 2, General Agricultural District. Would the applicant and the applicant's agent please come forward and commence with your presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair, members. Um, thank you for allowing us to be here today. My name is Robert Mills. Um, I'm with uh, PBR Hawaii, the agent um, for the applicant, which is the <coughs> Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. With me is uh, Roger Bond. He's a project manager with the church. Just to quickly um, explain this, um, this is a this is a project that's in the uh, Lualuale Valley of Nanakuli. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity that we've had to speak with many of you about this, and um, our, the proposal is to uh, rezone a piece of property, a five-acre piece of property in the valley from its current designation of Ag 1 restricted agriculture to the Ag 2 um, general agricultural district. Uh, this is uh, to allow the church to build a, one of its meeting houses uh, on this property. Uh, the church has owned this uh, piece of property for over 20 years and um, is seeking to build a church there to improve the community and to allow a place for its members to um, go to church. Um, currently they travel, uh, the members of the Nanakuli community travel to either uh, Waianae or to uh, Kaleloa uh, to attend church. Um, just to briefly, uh, as we're talking about the zoning, just to kind of help you understand what the purpose of this is, this is a site plan that we worked with the neighborhood board several times to uh, come up with the best solution for this site. Um, 
It allows plenty of parking, easy access off of Hakimo Road, and also off of Ulehava Street um, for members to come quickly and to be able to attend their services. Uh, services are primarily on Sunday and um, uh, maybe one or two nights per week just for youth activities, um, but ending no later than 10 o'clock. Um, as this is still in the agricultural area, um, we believe that having an agricultural element is very important to this site. Um, and so to incorporate this, this is some examples of agricultural elements that are at an existing meeting house. Uh, this one is on Kauai. And there's plenty of space on this site in Nanakuli to incorporate some similar things in the landscaping, uh, perhaps actual garden spots for members to utilize and um, really help in their own self-sustainment uh, in this area. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, Roger, did you have any questions or any comments? Uh, just that uh, in our construction of our facilities, we, we have multiple units that use the same building. We try to minimize the footprint that we have to build. And uh, so we'll have two or three congregations in, in this facility. And uh, we do are overutilized right now in the area. We have four congregations meeting in Waianae, which is uh, way more than they should have. And we'd like to be able to have the members that live in the area be able to stay in the area for their services. And uh, we believe it'll be a great benefit to the community to have them there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any questions for the applicant? Thank you very much, Jim. We do have a few registered testifiers. Rodney Oshiro. Followed by Brian Mano. Followed by Andrea Tupola. Aloha, Chairman Anderson and committee members. Aloha, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Rodney M. Oshiro. I live in Mikilova Valley in Anakuli on a pig farm. I have lived there all of my life except for when I was a student at the Church College of Hawaii for four years, four years in the Navy, and 16 years in the Coast Guard. I definitely support Bill 49, which proposes a zone change from Ag 1 District to Ag 2 District for the Hakimo Road Church property. It is located above from where most of the active farming is occurring in the Lower Valley. I'm asking that you and your committee members, after thoroughly pondering on all that has been and will be presented, to please support Bill 49 to allow the proposed zone change. Mahalo. Thank you. Members, any questions? Thank you. Brian Mano. followed by Andrea Tupola. Good morning, Chair Anderson and committee members. My name is Brian Manoa. I am a lifelong resident of Nanakuli, and I strongly support Bill 49. Uh, the proposed change from Ag 1 district to the Ag 2 will not change the nature of the neighborhood. The surrounding uses of the five-acre property along Hakimo Road in Lululele are primarily single-family dwellings and no other major agriculture production on any of the neighborhooding, uh, neighboring properties. The applicant and his agent have worked closely with the Nanakuli Neighborhood Board, meetings that I um, attended myself as well, and the Neighborhood Board supported the project unanimously. I urge the committee uh, members to support Bill 49 and to allow the proposed zone change. Mahalo. Mahalo. Members, any questions for Mr. Manuel? Thank you very much. Andrea Tupola. Hello, Chair Anderson and Council Members. My name is Andrea Tupola. I'm a Miley resident and I also sit on the Nanakuli Miley Neighborhood Board, but today I speak for myself. I'm a member of this congregation and I've attended the Neighborhood Board Committee meeting for zoning as well as the Neighborhood Board meeting where this was addressed, as well as the Farmers Bureau meeting where they had some additional concerns, as well as the past City Council hearing. So I've seen this bill all the way down the trail. And i just like to say that the community members have voiced that they're excited about the project and bringing something that will add sidewalks to an area that has 
no existing sidewalks and to a congregation that's meeting in a building that's over capacity so that we can have members attend church in the areas where they live in. I live one street over from this and I support this bill because I know that it'll bring good to the community and it's also going to be open for evacuation shelter and other things that the community members might need in an area that doesn't have a facility like this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, any questions? Mahalo. We have no further registered testifiers for Bill 49. Is there anyone else here with us who would like to testify who has not? Please come forward. I do not support this bill. I was born and raised on the west side myself. And uh, was actually brought up in the Mormon church when they used to be in Nanakuli till one of our members hanged himself on the banyan tree. They moved the congregation to Waianae. Religion is a controlling thing. And I would like to ask them, they believe so much in God. How come there is no kangaroos or no zaka? You want to see bureaucracy? This is my family land. From the lawyers, from the corporations, taken away from my family, asking for extension, 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 extension. This is egg land. When are we going to stop? Where are we going to farm out f to raise food for our people here? This kind of bureaucracy need to stop. Stealing our people's land is enough already. These churches, religions, these real people, I've had enough of this stuff. You know, my, my family worked very hard for our country, for our land. And this is what we get from you people, the government. Bureaucracy, paper, paper, paper. No money, paper, okay. paper, paper. They sell my family land, no money. 2009, they sell my family land. They're still asking for extensions. This is 2014. When you people gonna start helping us people? Stop putting my people down to the ground. I'm sick of it. I've had it with you people. I'm getting really tired of putting up with this government, you know. I have a lot of young Hawaiians that have been to Iraq, been to Afghanistan. They tell me, Uncle, you come here, here. you're a king. You tell us who to kill, we'll kill them all. You know, I have friends in South Africa. They fought for the country. They killed all the white people to kick them out of their country. And I, it's coming down to that here in our own country, in our land. Thank and you for your testimony. Stop. These have to stop. Members, any questions? Is there anyone else here with us who has not testified on Bill 49 who would like to? Uh, gentlemen, uh, in um, front of me, and then followed by Mr. Ta. Yes, uh, my name is once again Levi Landis, and I don't know about the whole, I'm not Hawaiian, so I can't claim the whole Hawaiian land thing, but I, I too would be opposed to this bill simply because of the fact that the agricultural land that they're rezoning to build a church, the church is there to help people. Why not use the land that they own that's already agricultural land to grow food, to feed the people that they're supposed to help, to grow the food to f help the homeless that the church is claiming to help anyway? Thank you very much. Mr. Ta. Thank you, Chair Anderson and members of the committee. Vernon Taw, I am sixth generation member of this church. I am very grateful and happy and proud to be a member of this church. And I ask you to seriously consider that uh, we have had this property for 20 years. Nothing has happened. No matter what everybody else says, nothing has happened on this land because um, there's no agriculture plants that can grow. You either have a pig pen or chicken, chicken coop. Um, families to us in our church is critical to, the, to our uh, eternity, eternal uh, progression. That's part of our gospel. 
the chapel will allow, allow us uh, to, to teach our families uh, what families are all about. And when the family uh, disintegrates in any government, in any country, the country disintegrates too. Thank you. Members, any questions for Mr. Ta? Thank you very much. Yes, offer your testimony. No, no, you, sir. Yes. Yeah. My question is, um, what kind of contribution will this church be making to the people without homes? Because if, if they're going to do this, and not a coolie could surely use, uh, you know, the, the, the part of their parking lot or, 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 or um, maybe um, part of their church for, for a sanctuary for um, a, a couple dozen folks that out there that need a place to live. And I, I ask you, are you folks, um, are you considering that as part of your plan? Uh, you can contact them later on if you have any questions yeah, well, as to I what like their plans are. Know this, because this is going to be a, uh, they're, they're asking for a zoning. Sir, this is not a public forum to question the applicant. Okay. If you have any questions for the applicant, you can submit them in writing to the applicant sure. if you'd like. Their contact information will be made available. Okay. Mr. Youngquist? Chair Anderson, members of the Council Zoning Committee and Council Member Fukunaga. Good morning. My name is Arvid Youngquist. Conflict of interest, not because I have a conflict, but because of a difference in religion. I'm a Roman Catholic uh, convert. Um, several years ago, I attended a funeral at a Catholic church in Anakuli. And then this year, my wife and I took a round trip country uh, bus ride and went that vicinity that is in question. Many people talk about keep the country country for the windward side, and perhaps we should say the same thing for the leeward, why I Nanakuli Coast. It's unfortunate that your committee member representing that district was not able to attend your hearing today. You do have one more chance to question an upcoming member of your zoning committee that you are recommending approval, Mr. Frank J. Lyon, and ask him what his take is on this particular thing. Maybe it's not proper to ask him a question, but it would be interesting if you ask him privately on a one-to-one -one interview. Thank you. Members, any questions for Mr. Youngquist? If not, is there anyone who has not offered testimony who would like to do, do so? Mr. Tara, followed by Ms. Grace. Please come forward. My good brother, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have, a, have a question about this. In this hour, however, two questions, two questions. Number one, the first question. In this hour, how I hope that, and if so, why, why aren't we building more homes? For the Catholic Maori. Um, that really all I wanted. It is in how I hope that, and if so, why are we not using this land to build a housing? And the one that the day before, the one that who are in Hawaii. Whoa, homeless in the own land, okay? Now, is this in Hawaii homeland? Yeah. Or, or, Korean government land there are. But if this is Hawaii homeland, <laughs> if this is Hawaii homeland, 
Um, why are we not building a home? This is my question. Thank you. Um, the members, a question from the testifier is whether or not this property is on Hawaiian homelands. The property in question is privately owned. If it was on Hawaiian homeland, the State of Hawaii Department of Hawaiian Homelands would also have to be here to support the, the reason. I'm just asking. No, understand. I'm not accusing anybody. Understand. But thank you for the question, Mr. Tano. But the, the, the property is privately owned. Thank you. Thank you. Granny Grace? Good morning. Good morning, Grace. Holly Grace, I now sit on the Nanukuli Mailis Neighborhood Board, but I'm better known as Granny from Lanikohonua to Kaena. I want you to support this plan of building a church. I'm not a, I'm not a Mormon. I'm a Catholic, and I was born and raised as a Catholic, and, and married as a Catholic, and I'm probably going to be dying as a Catholic. Okay, just wanted to put that on. This property has been vacant, as I know. I've lived there for 53 years out of my 78 years. It has been vacant. The only time I would see something that was agriculture was probably when I seen horses running on it. But there was only like maybe a week, a month, and that was it. They were taken off and it was always bare. And I think the why they bought the animals there was to eat the grass, to keep it down. So I would like you to support this program because, you know, we have a lot of delinquency in our area. And when a church is there, it will somehow, when you hear church bells, when you hear singing, you know, it kind of get to you. And as a child, you will hear and receive all of this and you probably take, you know, notice of it and maybe go visit the church and see what's going on and see what other activities are there. You know, children are, I don't know if you know now, besides my six children, 20 grandchildren, and 32 great-grands, and over 100 Hanais, is because children need to be where they are wanted, and they will be received, not on a corner, you know, trying to make out, making trouble. So I ask your support on this particular church. Whatever it is, it's a church. Remember, they represent God. Thank you. Thank you, Granny. Members, any questions for Granny Grace? Thank you, Granny. Is there anyone else here with us who has not testified on Bill 49 who would like to do so? Please come forward. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you, Council Chair Anderson, Council Members. I thank you for this opportunity I also ask for support of this bill. I've lived out in the one I coast for over 30 something years. And this piece of property, at one time they were trying to farm the land, try to grow fruits on the land, banana trees, papaya trees. Within one month, it's all dead and gone because the land is coral land. And to farm, really farm the land, you'd have to bring in truckloads of dirt. You need to first dig out some of the coral and then bring in truckloads of dirt to farm the land. And I understand, um, I overheard what well, the gentleman said that he would, they would allow the members to farm if they want to. They can farm, but they would have to make farm beds, first of all, to raise their crops. Or they would have to go into aquaponics and that would help their members to become self-sustaining in the area. It would be a plus for the members of the church. Having a church there would be very beautiful up on Hakimo Road. As everybody knows, Hakimo is known for farmlands. True. But this property, as um, Granny Grace had mentioned, it has been vacant for so long. We're tired of seeing bushes there, nothing growing, with a beautiful rock wall there. So to have them, to have you to change this zoning would be a plus for the community. A beautiful church standing there, having activities for the community as well as for their own members. 
I'm acquainted with a lot of the members that do attend this Nanakuli LDS church. And there's, I've heard a lot of complaints about how they need to travel out of the district or go to church in the afternoon when they have activities already planned for their families. Families are important. Family time is very important with this rush world that we live in now. So if they can have a church in their own community and attend church in a decent time that is suitable for them, for them and their families, that would be a plus for the community. So for me, I see nothing but a positive thing to have the church built on Hakima Road. And it would add to the community. Thank you. Mahalo. Auntie, could you please state your name? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Paulette Dibibar. I'm a resident um, in the Nakuli area. Mahalo Nui. Members, is there anyone else here who has not testified on Bill 49 who would like to do so? Please come forward. Hello, my name is May Fui Maono. Just real quick, um, I'm testifying in support of this bill. My family is a long time Laie family. And in um, our community, the Mormon church is huge there. And they also have huge gardens there for the community that my family has used for decades. And so I definitely am in support of something like this in other um, areas on the island. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I can only allow testifiers to testify one time, otherwise I need to reopen the floor to everyone who'd like to testify again. Is there anyone with us who has not testified on Bill 49 who would like the opportunity to do so? Okay, if not, members, the chair recommends that Bill 49 be reported out for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing before the full council. Any discussion? If not, any reservations? Hearing none, so ordered. Bill 49 has been reported out of committee for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing. Members, the chair further recommends granting a 90-day extension of time for Bill 49, subject to a written receipt of request from the applicant. So, so if you'd like that extension of time, uh, please make sure that you submit that request in writing. Uh, members, is there any discussion to granting a 90-day extension of time subject to receipt of a written request from the applicant? Okay, any objections, reservations? Hearing none so ordered. Members, we're gonna take the agenda out of order. The director of the Department of, Department of Planning and Permitting has asked to update the committee on the status of land use ordinance amendment sent to the department via city council resolutions prior to getting into the rest of the agenda. Members, this is not an action item. This is for discussion only. And the director has distributed uh, a copy of the report, which he'll be giving. Director, please uh, yeah, proceed. Uh, Chair Anderson, members of the committee, uh, yeah, uh, George Arthur, Department of Planning and Permitting. Um, the, uh, uh, the update that I've uh, uh, s submitted is uh, the same as the one that we had at the last uh, last month's committee meeting. So there's really no no change in schedule. So everything is, I think, going according to schedule. So if there's any questions, uh, I'd be willing to uh, entertain them. Mm -hmm. okay. Members, any questions for the director? If not, is there anyone who'd like to testify on the report that the director just gave? Thank you very much, director. Members, the chair is going to recommend that we take up the remaining items on our agenda together. I was going to split them up, but uh, the chair is going to recommend that we take all of these items together so that we can allow people to testify on all of them simultaneously. 
The agenda items are as follows. Bill 42, prohibiting, subject to exceptions, persons from sitting or lying on public sidewalks in the Waikiki Special District. Bill 43, prohibiting urination and defecation in public within the Waikiki Special District. Bill 45, prohibiting persons from sitting or laying on public sidewalks subject to exceptions. Bill 46, prohibiting urination and defecating in public places. And Bill 48, prohibiting subject to exceptions persons from sitting or lying on public sidewalks in areas zoned for commercial and business activities. Members, in regards to Bill 42, we have a proposed posted CD1 from Council Member Harimoto. Council Member Harimoto, would you like to discuss your CD1 or would you like to do that at a later time? Later. Okay. We have a number of other post, uh, a number of other CD, CDs or committee drafts that have been offered by members. Uh, some members who've offered those drafts are not currently seated. We will get into that a little later, but at this time, I'd like to call up the administration before we go into public testimony. Is the managing director here to represent the administration? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Members, before the managing director makes her presentation, the chair would like to note that at the July 24th Zoning and Planning Committee meeting, the so-called sidewalk bills which we are currently hearing were held in committee. On July 24th, this committee heard allegations that certain shelters require fees and identifications in order to receive services. It was alleged that police routinely prevent folks from obtaining identification, documents, and medications during enforcement operations. It was also alleged that the City Department of Facility Maintenance routinely charges a fee to re retrieve identification, documents, and medication from city storage facilities. It was alleged that families are routinely split up where fathers and mothers are separated from their children at certain shelter facilities. There was also unclarity as to the administration's Housing First and Affordable Housing Program and when that would be rolled out. Since these bills were deferred on July 24th, I've taken the opportunity to speak with some of our providers, the Honolulu Police Department, as well as members of the city administration to discuss the allegations and concerns that I just raised. And I look forward today to hearing exactly where we are, and I look forward to those allegations being able to be answered truthfully for this committee and for all gathered here to be able to hear. And I also look forward, members, to the facts that we hear today helping us to make an informed decision. Uh, Managing Director Shin, please proceed. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Anderson, members of the uh, committee, Ember Shin, Managing Director. Um, I would like to just deal with some of the issues relating to the bill itself, as well as the Housing First and Shelter issues. I will rely on Director Sasamura and Major Mann to discuss the issues of our current um, enforcement that are done pursuant to the SBOSNO uh, ordinances. And then, obviously, the providers may speak for themselves. So that's the order that I will be um, presenting. Uh, as you know, the, this bill was introduced by the administration primarily to address the Waikiki issues and the concerns about people <coughs> obstructing the sidewalks as well as uh, the hygiene issues in Waikiki. And before we introduced the legislation, we struggled with it. We did a lot of research. We looked at a lot of other cities. And we came to the conclusion that the best way to approach this would be through a legislation modeled after the Seattle. And that's what we then produced. Obviously, the, the um, concerns of the uh, other residents outside of Waikiki became paramount at that time because I think all of us suffer, all of us um, who live here suffer from obstructions on the sidewalk uh, and interference with our businesses, but not to the same degree as Waikiki. And as you know, Waikiki is our economic engine, and, and that's why we focused on Waikiki. It was not to ignore the concerns of the residents elsewhere on the island or the businesses that are located outside of Waikiki but we were hoping that Waikiki would be the model that we could look at 
and um, and with would be have the greatest chance of a successful implementation, as well as uh, defending against any constitutional challenge. Uh, and we continue to maintain that position that that is our the mayor's strong preference that the Waikiki Bill 42 pass out, as is for immediate implementation, uh, as well as the Bill 43, which is the urination defecation bill, which um, that is modeled after the state ordinance that affects Chinatown. Uh, um, we do have a hand carried CD1 for Bill 43. Uh, because there's a technical uh, problem in the language there. Uh, it refers to, in the um, exception, Managing Director, could yes. you uh, briefly summarize uh, what the administration's proposed amendments are? Yeah, the only proposed amendment we're making is to Bill 43, CD1, the urination defecation bill, and that's on the exceptions. The prior uh, bill, original bill, had a um, technical uh, uh, problem. It used the word section as opposed to article, and that's what we're asking. The whole article applies, uh, uh, will be the exception rather than the section, which is this section in here. Okay. And the same defect, uh, Chair, <laughs> applies to Bill 46. 46, which is the island-wide urination defecation bill. So that's the uh, proposed, hand-carried proposed CD1. Again, a very technical change only. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, because there was a lack of clarity about the administration's efforts with respect to Housing First and some of the housing um, homeless problems that homeless uh, policies and budgetary uh, allotments, uh, I wanted to speak about that. As you know, the uh, administration proposed, and this council adopted in May last year, the Housing First Plan, and that focused on three main areas, Waikiki, Chinatown, downtown, and the Leeward Coast. So uh, we were attempting to implement that uh, through uh, the use of CDBG funds originally, and that died when the Hoppy sale died. And so uh, the administration proposed and the council agreed to uh, allot, uh, appropriate, excuse me, $3 million in operating funds to Housing First. And that is our first um, priority in terms of expenditure, and that's the Housing First funds. And that is, as you know, Housing First is to acquire permanent supportive housing. So it's not just shelter, it's services. And uh, the RFP that um, was, is intended to provide the shelter, which is we're hoping through the form of rental vouchers, as well as ser uh, services, hit the streets on Monday. And so it is on the streets, and we are hopeful that, as you know, the process does take some time, and we're hopeful that we will be in contract and beginning implementation in October. So you've let the RFP The RFP out. is out. It was out okay. uh, on Monday. Okay. So, um, so we've, we've moved a little bit further since our discussion on July 27th when the, this committee uh, elected to defer the bills. Um, we share the co council's concern uh, that shelter needs to be in place uh, and needs to move tandem with the slit lie ordinance, and we are very, very cognizant of that. I have two comments with respon with re in response to that, and the first one is that homelessness is a problem that's been going on for a very long time, years, decades. And uh, the city and county of Honolulu is not the only one that suffers through this um, problem and the difficulty with uh, finding a good solution to homelessness. Uh, only in recent years has the model of Housing First been adopted by other states. And of course, you know that HUD and the federal government, through its funding sources, are now imposing this as the best practices model. And so we are sort of in the vanguard of adopting this nationwide as well as citywide. And as, as any program that is new off the ground, it does have its bumps. 
We have been, over the last year, working very, very hard with the provider community to pull every all of our resources together and um, move forward on the Housing First model. And the provider community has been extraordinarily responsive to this. And uh, we're hopeful that, uh, that this responsiveness, as they've gotten more training and they're doing assessments uh, and assessing the population to determine if they're eligible for this type of best practices model, is going to have real strong results soon. Uh, and uh, I know that the provider community um, appears to be very excited about this, this plan that both the state as well as the county, our city, have em has embraced and funded. So um, to continue with the, so that's my first point, and that is a problem that we hope is going to be cured with the best practices of Housing First. The second issue is the, um, uh, the notion that 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 the funds that we have allotted for Housing First, $3 million, as well as the state's funding through its SAMHSA grant, as well as its own funding, which comes out to a little over $3 million, uh, cannot be implemented quickly. And so to that end, we are working on trying to find a temporary Housing First solution. I am extraordinarily reluctant to give you a lot of details because I do not want to uh, create um, a furor over this issue until our site has been nailed down. Um, obviously, council members in this committee got wind of this at the last uh, council meeting and uh, attempted to question um, Director Whitty Oakland and um, Director Yang on this issue, and they were not prepared to speak about it. I am prepared to speak a little bit more about it, but without giving you a lot of ideas on um, specifics. Uh, but I can tell you this, that we are working with the state to try and identify <coughs> a site. That site will be on Sand Island. Uh, and uh, we have looked at many, many sites over the last six months, everywhere from park and rides in Hawaii Kai, to Alawai Golf Course, to Aloha Park in Waikiki, to the IAS Sugar Mill property, to abandoned fire stations, to all the parks that we have in, our, in the urban core, to the Alapai vacant lot next to um, FMB, uh, everywhere, and to determine any type of reasonable site that we can use for a temporary housing first solution. And much of this activity on our part has been promulgated by various council members that have promoted a form of a temporary shelter situation. And we have finally settled on a, um, a potential lot in Sand Island. It is by no means buttoned down with the state. And they are going through their due diligence process right now. We hope that in at least two or three weeks we will have that commitment from the state, they are the, gov the Abercrombie administration is very dedicated to working collaboratively with us to move this forward and to reach agreement on all the, um, the deal points um, as soon as possible. Once that is done, then we can move aggressively into formulating this temporary housing first. And the, f uh, the components of the housing first, temporary housing first, will be patterned after what we believe to be a best practices model. It is not, repeat, not a safe zone. It is not a safe zone. It is a temporary housing first program. And that will include services, 24 hours. It will uh, include security services. It will include transportation. It will include hygiene centers and um, uh, storage areas areas for families and pets, as well as individual men and women. Uh, Where will that facility be located, Managing Director? Sand Island. Okay. If, the, if we come to an agreement with the state, Sand Island is, we've done a lot of homework in this area. We've been working on, on trying to identify site for The property is owned by the state. It is owned by the state, right. right. And uh, uh, so those are the components of this temporary housing first. So it is not a safe zone. Okay. And the purpose of this project will be to um, 
to shift people from the streets and into temporary housing first, to provide them with services, to assess and triage them, to um, make them ready to move into permanent supportive housing, which we will be providing through both the state funding as well as city funding, which collectively will be around $6 million as we move forward, because that's our $3 million plus the state and the SAMHSA grant. And that is our goal, to move um, the people that are housed in the temporary housing first into permanent bricks and mortar type of housing. And that will be our goal. Okay, so that is our housing first program. Happy to answer any questions on that. Now, as you know, the council also appropriated in capital funds uh, 32 million in geo bond money as well as over 12 million dollars in affordable housing money we do not have a specific plan for those and as i said repeatedly during the budget process that the inability to have, to give us to fund resources for us because we are not in the housing business and we do not have administrative resources to do this um, it has delayed our ability to put into place a definitive plan in this area we have concepts and ideas. Um, we do know uh, that the money for affordable housing is in the fund is more flexible than the geo bond funds. We've met and talked with bond council over how we can use geo bond funds. But the bottom line for all of us, um, as we're dealing with the capital uh, budget uh, uh, that the council has appropriated for homeless and uh, low income housing is that it has to be something that the city acquires as opposed to grants out in some way, except affordable housing is more flexible in this way, so we can partner with other developers in building um, housing. So the that is my statement to you, and, and, and um, uh, I wish I could be more positive about this. We are looking very aggressively at diverting um, existing resources into this plan, and I hope to have something together fairly quickly on this issue. Um, having said that, though, we do have some plans for the money, and I wanted to share that with you. Part of the GEO bond money will be diverted into the Family Justice Center. The council appropriated that funding for an, as affordable housing money, but because that will be a direct acquisition by the city, and bond council has st told us that that is an appropriate expenditure of money for tax exempt bonds. We will be using part of that $32 million for the Family Justice Center. That will free up the affordable housing money to be reappropriated in the next budget session. That is not your mark for that fund, those funds. Um, so that is one way that we're spending the $32 million. The other thing that we're doing with the $32 million is we intend to renovate and rehabilitate two properties in Chinatown, and that is Pawahi Holly and Winston Holly. As you may know from the discussions during the Hoppy sale, there are a number of units that are vacant. There are six units that are vacant at Pawahi Holly and 26 units that are vacant at Winston Holly. And um, they're vacant because the, they are in such disrepair that they're not suitable for residency. And, um, and as you have already, I know um, Council Member Fukunaga knows this, and I believe other members of the uh, uh, committee know this, we are um, wrapping up and close to finalizing an agreement with um, uh, Mental Health Kokua to convert Pawahi Holly into a homeless facility. And um, we are putting money into a hygiene center there, and that will come out of our capital money to put the hygiene center in that facility. And, um, and we will be using some of the $32 million to convert those, not to convert, but to rehabilitate those six vacant units. And the purpose of that is to try and, and see if some of the existing tenants can be moved into Winston Holly um, as a... Uh, as we renovate those units and then totally converting Pawahi Holly into a housing first project um, under the management of the mental health cocoa, the safe haven. So that is our, um, our objective and, and how we're going to use part of the $32 million in funds. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Managing Director, thank you very much for that very comprehensive review as to where the administration currently is with your affordable housing, housing first initiative. Uh, members will note 
that while we did receive some information during our hearing last month, uh, the presentation wasn't nearly as extensive as what we received today. And I'd like to commend the administration, uh, not only for your work and your initiative, uh, but also for allowing me as the chair of this committee the opportunity, numerous opportunities, to meet with you folks over the last month to discuss your strategy, to discuss your willingness to partner with the state, and also to discuss your willingness to partner with the city council, especially the council members of those affected districts where you will be rolling out your Housing First initiative. Uh, members, I'd like to allow for some questions of the managing director, but uh, I would also like to bring up uh, the director of the Department of Facility Maintenance, and I'd also like to bring up a representative from the Honolulu Police Department. Uh, we do have Acting Major Mann and Captain Mahi here as well. But members, right now, do we have any questions for the managing director? Vice Chair Harimoto? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I do have many questions, so cut me off when you need to. <laughs> um, managing Director, thank you very much for that information. Um, as you know, I have been extremely opposed to these uh, sit lie bills. So with that said, um, let me ask some questions. So I'll start with, with I guess, the most uh, eye-opening statement that you made about the uh, temporary solution. So with the temporary solution, uh, not at this point regarding the site selection, but just the concept. So I clearly heard you say this is not going to be like a tent city kind of situation. Well, um, there will be tents there, but it won't be what you're thinking of as an Aala Park situation. Okay, so what you're describing is, is something that is controlled, something that is um, more of a temporary housing rather than a tent city. Correct. Okay. What is the concept of this now? How, how, why do we think the homeless people will go there? We're not forcing them to go. Is that correct? Well, you can't force anybody to yes. do anything, right? And um, it is making it available as a resource for them. I think that um, studies have shown and our experience and providers perhaps can answer this question uh, as well, that people don't necessarily choose to be homeless. Circumstances force them into homelessness. And that if they had a choice, they would want to be sheltered in some safe environment. And, um, and we always say that the urban legend is that, that the, the homeless that are chronic and on the streets are, are those that are mentally ill or um, you know, have drugs or something like that, and that's what's keeping them on the streets. But I, but I believe that I've had lots of conversations with different providers, and I think there is a genuine belief that no one really wants to be homeless. They want to be sheltered. And, and part of the reason they're homeless is because the options of shelter um, are perceived to be more restrictive or limiting. Um, and, and, and so we're hopeful that if we provide a safe environment with services involved, with transportation, with hygiene, that there will be an incentive to want to live in that type of an environment, even though it's not bricks and mortar. Okay, but there will be rules because you say this is Absolutely. Safe. It has to be. They will be internal rules, of course. Of course. Okay. And they'll be modeled after next step, which is the state. Okay, and I think facility. therein lies the problem yeah. because... Some in, of them will be modeled in after next step. In right. my discussions, that's one of the reasons that they choose not to go to the established conventional centers because there are all these rules. So, you know, I, I just wonder how, how successful this might be. Um, there will only be two barriers to admission, though, and that is on um, I'm blanking right here. I'm sorry, Pam and June, um, Director Woody Oakland, and, and, and Director Yang. The, as I recall, it's criminal felony conviction within the last two years, and um, uh, non. Um, residency, um, immigration status, so they're not, the illegal aliens, I'm sorry, that's the word I'm gra okay. grabbing for. But, so, but we know that one of the big issues 
is the concern about drug addictions and and mental illness. So no. would that preclude them no. from going into the shelter? No. Illegal alien and two years, um, a felony conviction within the last two years. So if someone is, has a drug addiction. It will not be a barrier. But obviously they can't do drugs. They will. Oh, violent crimes. I'm sorry. Two-year conviction of violent crimes. I'm sorry. I knew there was something else there. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm just trying to differentiate yes. what you're proposing to do as opposed to housing first. It is housing first. <coughs> so if someone, so it is. It is a, mo this is the, the restrictions on uh, entrance into the facility is the same restriction that we will be imposing for bricks and mortar housing first. The, if you're talking about the occupancy and the rules within the facility once they're there, then um, that's, obviously we're not gonna encourage illegal drug use. We're not going to, it's not illegal to drink alcohol, but it, illegal drug use would still be discouraged and, um, but I, it's not an environment where we're going to be bringing in the police to, to make arrests unless it becomes problematic. We're hoping we will have security and we are hoping that the, the group will self-police just as other types of these organizations have engaged in self-governance and we would encourage that type of a model. Even though this is a temporary facility. It is not intended to last more than a year or 18 months until we can fund more of the shelter and services of Housing First. So if someone were to go into that on day one, they could stay there until the permanent Housing First bricks and mortar unit is ready? That's correct. That's the plan. That's the objective. Yes. Okay. So with the pending change of state administration, do we have some assurance that um, the new administration coming in is not going to stop this from occurring? You're asking me to read the tea leaves of the political process, <laughs> as council I mean, it's member. Just, it's just unfortunate with the timing of this. You know, we're proposing something just out of the box, brand new, at the time okay. we're, we're changing administration. All right, I can answer it only in this way, because obviously I cannot make any commitments to an unknown new administration. We don't even know who it will be. Um, the Abercrombie administration is very, very um, uh, in agreement with this temporary housing first model. They are very supportive of it and they are moving very quickly to make their part of it work before they leave office. That's the only thing I can say in terms of this administration. And if we have the site in place, then it's on the city to make everything else work. Okay, so as far as the funding goes. Well, the funding is already there yes, for the year. it's already there. That's but correct. So you, right. you, well, the city and state has all the funding they need till but, this ends. So, but, yes. So there's not going to be a point where you're going to say, we ran out of money, we need more money, and what do we do? Well, next year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Next year. Okay. Yes, so additional we'll funds right, right, right. will be required to keep That's this correct. going. That's correct. Okay. And we'll look for your cocoa as you'll be in the state senate next year, council member. <laughs> well, let me just say it's, n it's well known that I have large concerns about this. Um, but not about housing first, no, council member. No, not housing okay. first, but this, right. this temporary or okay. whatever you call it. Uh, let me shift gears a little bit. So. You talked about the Powahi Hale and um, Winston Hale. Yes. So regarding the bigger picture of the sale, and I, I know we're not talking about the sale, but so this means then that conclusively we're taking these two units out of any proposed sale. Yes, we are taking those two units out of any proposed sale. That's correct. Okay. Um, just kind of a procedural question. So. Earlier was kind of wrapped into this whole big sale. Is any council action required now that we're changing gears on this? Uh, <laughs> not for this trend. Not for what we're doing with Pawahi Holly and Winston Holly. There okay. may be council action required as to what we may do with 
the remainder of the portfolio down the road, but uh, um, if you can just keep that in the back of your mind, and I hope to be coming up with some direction um, to Council um, on the portfolio very soon before okay. your next Council meeting. Okay, my only concern there is uh, with this action that you're taking on these two mm -hmm. projects, um, I just want to be real clear that it's not, how would you say, preemptive to anything, you know, that we're doing in a bigger scope. No. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, regarding the Housing First um, RFP that's out, so you're still committing to sometime in October to begin implementation? The award of the contract and to commence implementation, yes. Okay, and again, my constant question is, that's all fine and good, but what about getting the units actually online to be used? And again, I go back to my proposal to move the implementation date back to January 1st or some future date when we can align that implementation date with your units coming on board. If that were the case, then, uh, Council Member, you would have to look for, you know, even a longer period of time. And I don't think that the issues involving Waikiki really can wait. They've waited long enough, and uh, uh, the sense of urgency is now. It was yesterday. It will be tomorrow, um, and uh, the ability to to, to make inroads in this has to start with the first step, and this is the first step. So um, delaying it just delays it. Uh, it doesn't move towards resolution, and that's why we're urging the um, this committee to move uh, Bill 42 out as is with the effective date upon approval. Uh, we are cognizant of, of your concerns. Uh, but I suspect that, um, uh, and that's why we're looking at a temporary housing first to try and meet that issue, while the bricks and mortar part of it are um, uh, can be uh, put into play. I wish things could move faster. If it were my way and I could wave a magic wand, it would happen immediately. And I think the mayor is also of that mind. But sometimes the process just has its own. Um, uh, movement. Uh, okay, so if we don't go with a future implementation date, if we stick to the original saying effective upon approval, approval, assuming we approve this at our next council meeting, people will start getting arrested. Oh, absolutely not. That's the misconception, I think. But and that's what the bill says. It, that, it, it, Council that, member, that's the whole reason for a future date. No, council member, this bill gives enforcement power. It doesn't say that people will be arrested. The, the basic bill also says that they will be warned and citation. You know, the, this bill is not to put people in jail. This, people, this bill is to clear our sidewalks. This bill is part of compassionate disruption to move people off the street. Excuse me. Order. Excuse Order. Me. Well, while the committee is in deliberations, I respectfully ask the audience to please refrain from any commenting. I assure you that when you give your testimony, you will be afforded the same courtesy. Managing Director, Vice Chair Harimoto, please proceed. Thank you. The purpose of the bill is not to criminalize homelessness. It never has been. And, um, and that's, I think, the, the, the most difficult part of the public perception about this bill. Uh, the homelessness is not a crime, and people who are hanging around the sidewalk that this bill is intended to uh, to deal with are going to be encouraged to move away and move off so that they're not obstructing traffic, they're not obstructing the businesses that need to do business and deal with customers. And that's the intent of the bill. We don't want 
putting people in jail is not the objective. It costs us more to put people in jail. We would rather shelter them and spend the money. Of course, you know, we don't do prisons, but, but I mean, that's the objective. I mean, the whole purpose of Housing First is to, sh is to shift people into housing so that they don't go to emergency rooms, that they don't have to be put into <coughs> jails and use that as a shelter. I, I fully understand that, and I think we all agree with what you just said. We understand the intent is not to criminalize this, not to arrest homeless people. We understand that. But that, nevertheless, is what's going to happen. So what I'm failing to understand, Managing Director, is on implementation day, you're saying HPD will just encourage people to move along. So th that's fine. May but I have don't. Major Mann respond to what the police intend to do upon implementation? Yes. Okay. Good morning. As with any law that comes into play and it comes time for enforcement, first what we do is educate. A lot of the, a lot of the, is it on? It's on. Okay. Please proceed. A lot of the people we um, encounter, and I'm, I, I am the acting major in Waikiki, um, are regular individuals that we encounter daily. So we would definitely educate first. And as the law says, we would warn. That was, that's what our action, our first action would be. We'd ask them, warn them what the law was, and ask them to move. Only if we had to would we cite. And the last resort would be arrest. We do not want to arrest people. It takes our people off the road. It takes away from our other patrol duties. So we're hoping with the power to warn and ask them to move. And right now, we don't have citation powers. So if they refuse to move, that's it. But that was how we would implement it. And I appreciate that. But assuming that someone refuses to move on, then what would you do? Next step is citation. I mean, we would, we would encourage them. We want to work with them. And even citing, we don't want to go there, but that right. would be our next step. So can you explain what a citation means? It's citing for the violation. And eventually they would be, they would be given a court date and required to appear in court to answer to it. The citation is basically fine? It could be a fine, yes. Yes. Yeah, once they appear in court, they, yes, they could be fined. Right, a $1,000 fine. I, that's with the judiciary. We don't set the fines. That, that's, I think, what it says, $1,000. Okay. Up to, I believe, up to $1,000. So these people are homeless. Mm -hmm. They can't even afford the $200 to get their property back. Mm -hmm. They can't pay the $1,000 fine, so they end up in jail, most likely. Sir, we will warn them first, and we will educate them first. Okay, thank you. I, I just, just want to understand what's happening. Okay. Um, Vice Chair, do you, you have any? Um, just one final question. Further questions. Um, different subject, but regarding the uh, uh, opening of the Waikiki restrooms. So in prior discussions with the Parks Department, I believe they're targeting to open any day now. Is that, that correct? Yeah, we, uh, the Waikiki bid has approved uh, the plan, and uh, we need to set up um, the security detail and a few other um, uh, just implementation logistical issues. We're uh, expecting to become fully operational in mid-September. Okay, and this is the restroom next door to the police so, please, station? Yes, Kuriho Beach, yes. Okay, so it's 24-7? Correct. It'll be a pilot program for about three four months. Three or four months. So if there's problems, you will shut it down? No, I think the whole issue is to, cr uh, to be able to provide an alternative um, because of the uh, urination defecation bill and to provide access. And so we will be um, uh, looking at use rather than problems, use, usage, whether it will actually be used during those hours. Mm, okay, so you'll be monitoring counts? We will be doing counts, yes. We okay. contracted to do that. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, when current enforcement action uh, is taken, of Director Sasamura, your department implements that enforcement. Good morning, Committee Chair Anderson and Council Members. Yes, my name is Ross Sasamura. I'm the Director and Chief Engineer of the Department of Facility Maintenance. Our department is charged with the responsibility and the authority to enforce the stored property and the sidewalk nuisance ordinances. And which agency assists your department with that enforcement action? We work closely with the Honolulu Police Department and we also work with the Department of Parks and Recreation to ensure that we also maintain control over any stored property in parks areas as well. Okay. 
If these sit lie bills in front of the committee today uh, do indeed become ordinance, would your department and HPD continue to be charged also with storing property if, in fact, uh, that does become necessary through enforcement? It's within the responsibility of the Department of Facility Maintenance, so we'll continue to store property as we have been. Okay. Would you please, uh, you as well as uh, the police department representatives, explain the process of enforcement when belongings uh, are uh, seized and taken into custody for storage by the city? Normally when we provide enforcement on sidewalk nuisances or stored property, we would establish a work area using barrier tape. And at that time, if there are people within the tape, they are advised to remove any life's necessities from the area, take them with them. That would include things like medications, identification, currency. And if um, there are situations where people aren't around, or there are circumstances which result in their removal from the area because of their behavior, because of their conduct, because of the danger that they pose either to themselves, the workers, or other people, then they would be asked to leave, their items would be stored, but there is the means by which they can reclaim any life's necessities without having any charge assessed against them. And those life necessities are defined as? Well, they could be things like identification, important papers or documents, currency, medications. So are you telling the committee that when folks go to your storage facility and if they need to retrieve medications, identification, important documents, that your department allows for retrieval of that property without charging any type of fee whatsoever? That's correct. Okay. Uh, additionally, you also were talking about there being certain instances where you may not allow an individual to re-enter their shelter at the time of enforcement to obtain their life necessities. What types of cases would that be? There would be situations where a person um, exhibits aggression, exhibits the, the possibility that they could do some violent things to the workers that are there, pose a danger to themselves and other people. And in such an instance though, would said person still be permitted to come to your facility the next day to retrieve their items with no charge? They would be permitted to make an appointment to pick up their items. We have done that in the past. So free of charge. Free of charge. So just to be clear that the stored property ordinance does not require any payment of fees for retrieval. It's just a sidewalk nuisance ordinance that someone would incur a $200 charge to, to basically claim their items. However, we have a hearings process that is already in place. We have had multiple hearings. I believe to date we've had somewhere in the order of 23 to 25 hearings where people are actually allowed to come in, fill out some forms, explain their situation, and demonstrate the fact that they're unable to pay the $200 fee. And for a large number of them that have been heard, those fees have been waived for those people to reclaim their items. But what you're saying, just to be clear, is that no fee is charged if someone comes to your facility and request to retrieve their life necessities. If they're just asking for their life's necessities, first and foremost, there is no charge whatsoever. That's correct. And in just, just to be clear, we have a phone number on the storage and removal notice, or the storage and disposal notice, I'm sorry. There's a phone number that they can call in order to make the appointment to reclaim those life's necessities. Okay. Did the Honolulu Police Department representatives have anything to add? to Director Sasamura's comments in regards to enforcement action? I would, the only thing I would add to that is that we're there to ensure the safety of all involved. That's the only thing I have to add. Okay. Okay. Members, do we have any questions for either HPD or the administration? Council Member Kobayashi. But when they're, um, aren't, aren't they given a chance to get all their life necessities before they're put into storage? They are. And they're, but they're so at that time when they're being asked to move, they, they have the opportunity to get all their... Once we establish the work zone, they're offered the opportunity to take their life's necessities with them. But there are situations at times where, where because of their behavior, they're told to, to leave immediately, at which point they can reclaim their items without incurring any kind of fee that they have to pay. Okay. Thank you. And fo oh, sorry, following up on that Family Justice Center, which will help the victims of domestic violence, um, that was 
that will be uh, that project will start September. I mean, the uh, appropriation will be released before September first. Is that right? Yes. Oh, great. Thank you. Councilmember Menor. Uh, glad that the administrations are being proactive in regards to uh, trying to move ahead with that temporary housing first uh, project on Sand Island. Uh, having said that, I just wanted to ask you for clarification. Do you have an approximate um, time frame uh, with respect to when uh, the administra administration hopes to, to have uh, that project implemented and opened up? And secondly, could you also clarify again the sources of funding to, to make that project a reality? Yes. Um, we have an internal deadline and goal, uh, and once I say it, everyone will expect it, and then we'll be really in trouble if we can't meet it, because there's some things we can't control. But our goal was to have it open and running within um, three months. But that's our goal, and as soon as all these cameras are on here, all, everyone's gonna ask me the questions and try to nail me down, but that, that was our internal goal. Right. And then the uh, sources of funding again? Yes, the sources of funding will be, it's a temporary housing first. It'll be out of our $3 million housing first money. Okay. And then uh, the, the other follow-up question is that um, in regards to the um, Waikiki Sid Lai um, bill, um, during the previous hearing on that bill, the uh, administration through um, Director Woody Oakland had clarified that um, at present, even without the development of these additional uh, shelter spaces through the um, temporary housing first, as well as the issuance of the RFP, that at present, on any given day, that there are uh, available uh, shelter spaces that could accommodate the uh, homeless uh, individuals uh, in Waikiki who would be impacted by this bill. So could you clarify that point? Yes, uh, I have the most recent statistics on emergency, emergency shelter vacancy rates as of the end of last week. And the, um, I don't have everything written down here, I'm sorry. Uh, there were 120 emergency bed spaces opened on Oahu at, um, last week, and 54 of which were in the downtown Waikiki area. And I asked, asked the question, of course, because I just felt it was important to clarify that uh, even during that lag time or that time period uh, within which the administration will try to, uh, to right. get the temporary project up and running, right. that uh, if the uh, Waikiki bill were to be uh, passed and implemented uh, prior to that, uh, yes. the completion date of that temporary project, that there uh, is adequate shelter spaces to accommodate the homeless population would be impacted by the um, right. bill that would apply to Waikiki, correct? That's correct. Members, any further questions for HPD or for the administration? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have a representative here from the Institute for Human Services? Please come forward. Good morning, I'm Connie Mitchell, Executive Director for the Institute for Human Services. This is Jerry Coffey, our Clinical Director as well. Good morning. Thank you. We've uh, heard allegations in regards to the different uh, procedural operations at, the, at the, the Institute for Human Services, and I'd like to provide uh, some clarity for the committee members. Can you clarify for us, uh, are those who seek service at IHS required to submit some form of identification in order to receive services? I'm grateful for the opportunity to answer that question. And any other questions that you folks may have relative to the policies and procedures at IHS, specifically those that deal with uh, how folks have access to our services. I, am, uh, I would like to identify myself to you folks as the one singular individual at IHS who supervises the clinical team and supports the operations team and together with my guidance and support they execute decisions every single day relative to who comes to IHS and who is not ready to be at IHS. So I'm grateful to have the opportunity at least where emergency services at IHS are concerned to respond directly to those allegations and to identify myself 
as the individual who is 100% of the time responsible for ultimately making those decisions. Connie's uh, busy, and the day-to-day -day operations and that type of decision-making typically falls to me. With regard to your question of IDs, it has never been a requirement to enter IHS that an individual have a photo ID. In fact, it's one of the first things that we typically do for individuals who come to IHS is to t support them through the process of applying and accessing that state ID, which is the golden ticket to applying for housing and getting all the other benefits that they uh, have allowed to lapse um, in place. So producing a picture ID has never been a requirement of entering IHS. Um, and it won't be for the foreseeable future. There are also questions. Um, you know, one of the... Did you have any other questions related to... <laughs> In addition to the identification question, uh, I also wanted to ask if IHS requires payment of fees for your services that. and what those fees are. Thank you. It is the philosophy of IHS that one of the best ways that we can support folks to independence is to provide a hand up and not a handout. We do charge a shelter fee at IHS. Those fees are as follows. For single men and women, it's the equivalent of $3 a day uh, or $90 a month. For families, the shelter fee is $120 a month or the equivalent of about $4 a day. Roughly a third of the folks who live at IHS in a given year are waived from paying that shelter fee. We've heard that there are fees in the, in the amount of uh, neighborhood of $400 I'm charged at times. We also have a policy in effect for individuals who make a choice to travel from the mainland to become homeless in the state of Hawaii. And for those individuals who are new on the island within 30 days, it is our policy uh, consistent with that we also charge a fee for local folks that they do pay a shelter fee each month in the amount of $400. If they are unable to pay that fee, just like for our local folks, they are given the option to volunteer in the shelter environment as an alternative to paying that shelter fee. It is also the case that if folks coming into IHS are disabled either physically or have a psychiatric condition that make it difficult that they would be able to volunteer that four or five hours a week in our shelter, that that expectation that they volunteer is additionally waived. And the reason why we do that is because myself, as a licensed clinical social worker, I operate under a code of ethics. And that code of ethics tells me that any time I withhold an intervention or a medication from a client and withholding that uh, intervention or that support to that client makes their condition or their situation worse, that is unethical. So it has been very confounding for the homeless provider community in the last few months uh, to understand that what appears to be an intentional campaign of untruth about the policies and procedures that make it possible for people to have access to emergency shelter, that that information would be spread, that would then in and of itself become a barrier to people who are truly vulnerable accessing our shelters. We are completely confused and confounded. Okay. So I hope I've answered those questions um, to your satisfaction. You know, the, the idea of dealing with mainland homeless, for us, it's not an abstract concept. It's not something that we read about with our morning paper and drink our coffee and wonder what, what should be done. We are in a position every single day of having to think critically and make dis informed choices and decisions that are as compassionate and as humane as we possibly can while still experiencing that individuals will come directly to our shelter from the Honolulu International Airport what is interesting to note about many homeless from the mainland is that they have benefits. They have an income. They have the ability to contribute. Many of them also have the ability to become employed and to become contributing members of our society. And it is our expectation at IHS, which is an emergency homeless shelter whose core mission is to house people, that if an individual has the ability to earn an income towards affording their own housing, that that is a reasonable, and frankly, a humane expectation that we would have of that individual. Thank you very much, Mr. Coffey. Uh, in regards to the IHS shelter for families, uh, could you tell us a bit about uh, your shelter for families? And could you also tell the committee whether or not it is your routine practice to uh, separate families? In other words, where you'd ask the male of the household to enter the male facility or the lady of the household to enter the women's facility? 
away from the children? Or is it your goal to try to keep families together? It is our goal to try to keep families together. The capacity of the family dorm at IHS is uh, roughly about 30 families, uh, families of four, if a family was a family of four, which typically comes to about 140 individuals. At the moment, we have about 40 school-aged kids. Uh, at the moment, we have about 40 children. Most of them at this time are under the age of five. Um, average length of stay for a family in the IHS family dorm is anywhere from four to eight months. We place 80% of the fam or I take that back, 80% of the families who come into the IHS family dorm are working. These are folks who earn a, a living, uh, who work, however, are not earning a living wage to afford their housing. The goal of the IHS family program then is to give them an opportunity to catch their breath, to reestablish a recognition of the need to save money, uh, establish a savings account, and we support them in applying for transitional and other types of housing. One of the practices that we uh, exercise each day to ensure the safety of those folks who live in our facility, that number roughly 350 a night, we conduct a criminal background check for folks who come into our shelter because we think that it is appropriate to understand as much as possible uh, who's coming into our shelter. When an individual has a criminal history, it in and of itself is not uh, a rule out. It gives uh, myself and my staff the opportunity to make informed decisions about how we'll be able to integrate that individual into an institutional setting safely. IHS has an obligation in particular in our family dorm to interrupt a cycle of domestic violence. And we, on occasion, when it's clear that a couple is uh, buckling under the stress of being uh, in their predicament, and there uh, are documented and, and situations uh, where there is physical abuse, uh, verbal abuse, um, it's not appropriate to allow a couple who is uh, experiencing open and current domestic violence to continue to live in a dorm environment with 130 other folks. So our typical response in that situation to be as supportive of that family unit as possible is to extend an invitation to the male member of that household to relocate to our men's facility. Uh, and oftentimes a, a, a contract will be developed where that individual will be asked to attend anger management. Uh, we offer anger management at IHS. We can make that very accessible to them. Uh, they're welcome to pursue that, that intervention someplace else. Often a drug assessment. Uh, we understand that uh, drugs and alcohol also might be a contributing factor to the domestic violence. And we develop and execute a contract for couples so that when the contract is complete and they've met the, the terms and conditions of the contract that allow us to feel comfortable that that is a safe individual to have back in our family dorm, those individuals and those families are reunited. Do you routinely have available space in your family shelter? We typically have a wait list um, that can be anywhere from one to three weeks for our family dorm. And uh, as I have uh, unfortunately on many occasions over the last several weeks in a public f uh, forum just like this, I'll remind any family that's interested in coming into the IHS family dorm that the process is very simple. Uh, we require that they come to the shelter and complete a very simple and brief wait list uh, registration form uh, and we follow up from there. When we have beds open and available, they will come in immediately. Actually, we have had space in the last um, few weeks particularly and people on the wait list are often served even if they don't come into the shelter. And that's because you know they may be doubled up somewhere. And because we regard ourselves as an emergency shelter, we tend to save space for the people that are unsheltered, and particularly those who have young children. So you said people who do not come into the shelter are served. Yes. Served how? Um, if they would like to receive case management or they need referral to housing, we provide those as well. So it's like if even if you don't come into the shelter, we can help you. You know, because there are other programs that can. Be, be offered. So you're saying, Ms. Mitchell, that your family shelter currently does have space available? I didn't check this morning, but I know that there was um, one family last night. That we have we four did. bunks open. Oh, we do. Okay, thank you. Okay, Which so is the equivalent of 16, 16 individual people. people. Mm -hmm. Okay. IHS, uh, coincidentally, and you haven't asked, but I'll uh, just on behalf of Connie and myself and IHS, we support SITLI. And I want to offer a little bit of context as to why it is, given our unique mission. Uh, the mission of IHS, um, Father Dutil was very clear very early on uh, that he wanted to uh, work with and support folks who were at the most vulnerable end of the spectrum, who were homeless. Um, I don't speak today to everybody that is on that continuum of homelessness. But as regards the sit-lie law, 
and the outreach team that I supervise and conduct every single day, that team consists of a psychiatrist, a nurse, uh, and uh, four or five other outreach uh, individuals who are in town in Waikiki on the North Shore in Oahiwa every day. The term compassionate disruption, from my perspective, again, this is in reference to those folks on the continuum of homelessness who are gravely disabled. Any opportunity that we have as a society to create a change or a shift in the dynamic that makes it possible for us to support an individual who, to use a medical term, is not self-preserving. Somebody who's not self-preserving is a person who is incapable of making decisions on their own behalf. People who are psychotic, people who are dehydrated, people who are malnourished, uh, people who have uh, untreated uh, chronic medical conditions. It is our hope that with the support of this law, it would be possible for us to put together and execute comprehensive interventions with the partners that we already have and are working with every single day, HPD, EMS, Hawaii Fire Department, Queens Emergency Room, and the social workers in Queens and Queens Psych Unit. These are people that we have worked with in partnership for years. And these people are on a first name basis with, for example, the six individuals that the police officer was mentioning earlier. Implementing an ordinance like this, uh, Council Member Harimoto, is not something that happens like flipping a switch. At least the clinical services and the interventions that my team are implementing on the street every day, it could be months to establish a bond and a working relationship that is a two-way relationship because nothing else actually frankly works. It is the only way that you can support a change in human behavior is to establish a trusting bond with that individual. It's, uh, it wouldn't work to do it any other way. So I'm here to speak directly to your concern that what happens uh, the moment this law is passed? Well, I can speak for my staff and I can speak for the philosophy of services that IHS provides. Compassionate disruption would involve the participation of a large network of people uh, who would be working over a period of time to expedite any and all interventions that we think would work and that were unique to that individual's needs. We understand their mental health histories. We know their medical histories. We, we're able to understand what their history of case management has been over the years with other providers and to understand what unique barriers and difficulties other service providers had. Uh, it, in Waikiki as a case study, we're talking about a very small and as we all know, very visible group of people. And we're hoping then that with this uh, law, it makes it a little bit easier for us to pull that coordinated outreach effort together which uh, currently doesn't exist to the extent that it could, um, if there were, again, that shift in the circumstances for that individual who is gravely disabled to realize some positive change in their life. Can I Thank just you. make a statement? Yes. Um, we really believe that people deserve better than the street. I mean, that's the bottom line for us. And that not having the streets be an option for resting will actually bring more attention to those who need help help of all kinds, and you know, whether it's with housing, employment, medical attention, no one can be ignored. You know, if it's not okay legally for someone to be there, they won't be ignored. I think a lot of people right now are ignored. You know, the, currently it reinforces the notion that lying on the streets, the, the new bill would reinforce the notion that lying on the streets is not a viable option, so you have to choose something different. And so that's what we hope. And we really believe that this bill is not about promoting, um, is not about criminalization, but more about promoting access to services. With all due respect to the managing director, um, it is not an urban myth that substance abuse and mental illness are a major driving force for homeless folks. Um, they certainly do not represent the total population of homeless individuals. But I am on the phone three times a day with an emergency room somewhere on this island, clearing a hospital referral into my shelter, and the presenting issues for that individual upon going to the emergency room, nine out of 10 times, is a psychosis with methamphetamine addiction. So I disagree with that statement, and I would like to ask the public and anybody that's here listening to understand that IHS's unique position relative to this issue and relative to intervening with homeless individuals uh, comes about as a direct consequence of the fact that we have very, very, very sick people that we see. And we don't mean to imply when we are passionate about these issues that we see all homeless people as being that dysfunctional and that sick. We don't uh, see them uh, through just one color. So 
And actually, Jerry, you know, I think that um, when people see people who are unsheltered homeless, they're only seeing a small portion of the people that really do suffer homelessness. Many of them are in shelters. Many of them, you know, remain hidden, you know, in different ways. But I think the ones that most people see, you know, they are very much affected by um, substance abuse, both alcohol and drugs, and mental illness. But, you know, certainly, as Jerry said, we're not saying that that's the case for everyone. But, you know, for unsheltered people, you know, there's a very prevailing, you know, problem that they have to deal with. In addition to shelter, you also offer meals for your clients? We do. We offer a whole spectrum of services. And, you know, as I mentioned before, the shelter really is not sh just shelter. You know, it's a multi-service site where people, when they come, they're able to access meals three times a day if they need they access health services, you know, they're triaged by our nurse, you know, to go to the emergency room if they need to. We've seen just horrendous kinds of infections, you know, that people bring into the shelter that we are able to then, you know, make sure they get the treatment that they need. We also have housing and employment services that are key for a lot of people that don't need a lot of really intensive services. They just need a job, and that's what we focus on. So I think that that kind of assessment, you know, that really tailors the services for each person is what we specialize in. So we really, you know, feel like it's a place that is just not only about shelter. And so I, I think that there are other places that do it too. And so to just say, oh, well, do we have enough shelter space is not necessarily the question, you know, that we ask. It's about where else can they go to take the next step. And it could be in a residential treatment program. It could be, you know, just going to detox first. It could be going to the hospital because they really need help, you know. Members, any further questions for IHS? Vice Chair Harimono? Thank you. Followed by Council Member Fukunaga. Thank you very much for explaining a lot of these issues. I, I, I understand there's a lot of misunderstanding and misperceptions. Um, couple questions. The one is, um, so do you support the idea that the managing director talked about having this interim solution of this, I, I guess I still call it a tent city? I think, you know, this is, today was the first time I heard about the um, proposal, so I'm not um, uh, sure what it would look like. But I think um, there's there's definitely, um, you know, different perspectives that people take. You know, if what you're calling like a tent city, we probably don't support that. But I think what the managing director was describing was a place where services would be offered um, to the degree that they are and that they are delivered in a safe environment. It's probably, you know, a temporary solution, as she mentioned, that really would need to be, you know, um, carefully implemented. So I wouldn't, you know, for me, I'm not saying yes or no. I think I would need to know more about how it would be implemented. I think you asked the managing director a very good question when you asked about the rules. And why would it be that a homeless individual who doesn't want to live in an environment that's highly structured would choose to go to an environment that is likely highly structured? Um, you know, an interesting disconnect is happening for me over the last several months. As homeless providers are being asked to take responsibility for the personal choices that individuals make to remain homeless, um, folks who currently are not coming into an emergency shelter, in my opinion, would, as you have already guessed, uh, be resistant to the same uh, in the scenario which she was describing. Thank you for saying that. I, I'm, I'm if it was going to be a safe and well-run program, assuming that it was safe and well-run, IHS is an institution. It's a big building. We have security cameras. We have locking doors. I wish we didn't, but we do. And it's still a challenge to ensure that the safety of all of our guests is there 100% of the time. We, we accomplish it, but it's not easy. Right. So, so in the case of what the managing director described, um, I'm not sure how many people will be there, but I mean, despite the fact that they're talking about security, I mean, from your experience, um, when you have a large concentration of, of homeless people, any people for that matter, who may have mental conditions or drug addictions, I mean, isn't, isn't that almost asking for trouble when you concentrate them all together? Well, history would indicate that that might be the case because the, the ones that have been tried here, um, not in the housing first context, you know, that maybe the director has described. Because I think one of the things that um, is different from, say, what she described and what happens in a shelter is that you have kind of your own space, you know, in what she described, because you have your own tent, 
And so you have that space that is supposedly yours, but is very vulnerable to somebody else too. So somebody else coming in and taking your things could be a possibility as well. And so those are the things that you would have to deal with. I mean, we deal with that just because, you know, most of well, all the people in our shelter are out in the open and they can see what other people have, you know, but those are some of the issues, you know, and if somebody is using and they're not in their right mind, you know, um, certainly some issues could come up that you have to deal with. So, you know, I'm glad to hear that she's thinking that security is needed. Because mm -hmm. in you know, any of the shelters, I believe we, at least at IHS, we don't allow any drug use on property yes. or alcohol. So that makes a big difference yes. because when people are under the influence, there's all kinds of things that can happen. I agree with what Connie's saying, but I, I would like to hear more. I would like to know more about what it is that, that today is the first time we've heard about it, yeah? So I'd love to know more about what they're thinking of doing. Okay, but, but I am very concerned about that issue of, of drug use. You know, I understand why you have those rules. But if the managing director is saying, you know, we'll discourage it, but, you know, okay, they can. Um, that in itself is going to promote, I think, many, many, many issues. Um, wouldn't you agree, I mean, in your experience? I think it really depends on how um, the whole program is structured. And it would be a program because obviously you would have rules. And I think if there is sort of like a, um, you know, um, intake process, you know, if people are not honest, you know, you could run into some problems there as well. I mean, it, it really does have a lot of things that need to be thought through and that, you know, need to be structured. I wouldn't say that it's not, in, you know, that it couldn't be successful because there are some other places where people have gotten together and they have these, you know, campsites, you know, so to speak, you know, where they share space. But I don't know that um, those groups of people were... Um, as affected, you know, by substance abuse, you know, as Jerry mentioned, you know, it is something that unfortunately Oahu does have to deal with. We have a high rate of methamphetamine abuse, and that is something that definitely impacts all of our social services, you know, throughout, you know, when you look at all our systems, that is something that we have to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. Sobriety is not a condition of being a resident at IHS. Good behavior, safe behavior is a condition of being an IHS. Thank you. So one last question. So Mr. Coffey, you mentioned uh, nine out of ten of those referrals from the, the ER, I guess it was, um, with this uh, condition, methamphetamine psychosis. Suicidality with methamphetamine-induced psychosis. Thank you. <laughs> so when you accept one of those patients or people, um, I guess there's intensive services that go with that. Um, I would imagine that's very highly skilled specialist um, in a situation uh, like the tent city that the managing director is talking about. Could you imagine those folks going directly into that situation? I guess I would need to know more, as Connie says. The assumption is that what they would have in place would be some sort of a program. So I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt to know what is the program that they want uh, to have in place. It would need to be a uh, source of funding uh, with the staff and a skill set of those staff that would be fairly broad-based in order to have a program in place that would address uh, a meth, uh, meth addiction coming into their shelter. Um, but to the extent that IHS accepts people like that on a daily basis, not only are we assuming an incredible amount of liability that makes it the case that we have to maintain extreme vigilance, um, we do have a program in place, and we do have services, and we do have staff ready to intervene with that individual. We have a nurse that meets with those folks and helps them to organize their medications and ensures that they're taking their medications on a daily basis when medications are indicated. We have a subs an outpatient drug and alcohol treatment program embedded with our shelter so those folks get an assessment. Uh, sometimes if it's a frequent flyer, and we know that this is Fred, and this is the third time this month that Fred is going to Queens saying he's suicidal and having, you know, the effects of meth, we'll say, Fred, this time we need you to consent to a substance abuse assessment, and let's see you follow the conditions or the requests, the requirements or the recommendations of that assessment, uh, and we'd love to have you come back into IHS, and we want to help you to get back on your feet. And Fred says yes half of the time. And half of the time, Fred completes that substance abuse assessment, and Fred goes to the outpatient drug and alcohol treatment program, and pretty soon Fred's got his housing application turned in. But if Fred doesn't come into the shelter, Fred doesn't have access to that continuum of service. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. So, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to get on the table. that I think may we may be oversimplifying the issue of just, you know, put a 
put a facility here and tents here, and I, I have grave concerns. But uh, thank you for your leeway in having me ask questions. But I, I do want to ask further questions of IHS later. Um, I guess I'm expecting the Waikiki Improvement Association to testify, and I probably will have questions for IHS at that time. Would that be okay? That would be fine. Thank you. I would like to add, uh, though, uh, Vice Chair Harimoto, I understand your concerns with what the managing director has shared with us and the facility that they're looking at. But I would emphasize uh, that the managing director did say that it is indeed not a safe zone or a tent city. I will take her at her word on that. I would also like to state uh, that I have personally, not on behalf of the council, but I have personally committed to doing everything possible to assist the administration in establishing that area, that service area. And I've also uh, committed to the administration that I would work with the council and if possible, do what we can to provide any additional funding next year to help to uh, further establish this if need be. I, I, I realize that there are some concerns with it, uh, but I do believe that this is preferable and it's a lot more humane and it's a lot more um, I would say, Vice Chair, that it would be a lot better to do this than to uh, have people on the streets subject to the elements and uh, subject to other dangers. And I do understand your concerns, uh, but I am hopeful that we can work with the administration on this. Councilmember Fukunaga, do you have any additional questions? Yes, well, I guess one thing I did want to um, you know, highlight is uh, some of the kinds of programs that IHS and Mental Health Kokua have worked on in the downtown Honolulu area are really um, not kind of a scattered site type of arrangement, but what we are really looking at is to expand upon the existing safe haven model, which is um, located at the top of Fort Street Mall. You know, they, they are going to be uh, relocating from that location fairly soon, so um, the goal was really to have safe haven partner with IHS and other providers in controlled, secure settings that would represent um, the kind of environment that individuals with mental health challenges as well as substance abuse needs uh, can be assisted in and be housed in a way that is uh, safe for them as well as beneficial to their surrounding neighbors. I guess one thing I would ask um, IHS is uh, to what extent do you believe that um, the state's uh, efforts, you know, to assist with the um, Act 221 assisted community treatment um, legislation will be an important part of whatever the city and state are doing in providing housing because I think it answers one of the questions that was raised you know what about people who don't want to um, necessarily leave the streets I, I think that um, that's a really good question you know that um, in recent times when people have been talking about housing first one of the um, the elements that um, has been described as part of Housing First is that people are not coerced into any kind of treatment. And so um, in one model, it would preclude someone who is under that kind of court order to even participate in the program you know, and housing that person. My hope is that there will be uh, a variety of housing programs that would really meet the needs of a variety of people, even among the people who are mentally ill. The kind of person that um, you know you described as someone who doesn't even know that they're mentally ill, and at you know, at no time would voluntarily take their medications, and so we've seen the person cycle in and out of jail, in and out of the um, ER, and in that particular case, Act 221 is assisted community treatment. I think it's critical that uh, we in Hawaii have a law, an effective law that really allows us to provide court-ordered treatment for some people. Not for all, you know, for a small number of people that really just won't make that choice and continually go back into jail, you know, or um, to the ER all the time. So I think, um, you know, we, we really hope that we're able to work with the courts, you know, to make that happen. But quite frankly, that has been very discouraging, you know, um, up till now. Thank you. The chair would also like to recognize the presence of Council Member Joy Monahan. Thank you for being here with us. Members, are there any additional questions for the Institute for Human Services? Council Member Monahan. Um, you mentioned, I, I, I was watching the hearing from uh, upstairs, and thank you for, for, for your testimony here today. First of all, th I'd like to thank the chair for, for saying that he would support the concept of uh, 
the compassionate component, I guess. Uh, but uh, we do need to work closely with the administration to be able to implement it. I think that's key. Um, uh, having said that, uh, they did notify me, and uh, we've had uh, preliminary discussions, but uh, I would like to know as well uh, more details uh, from them. But uh, my question, I guess, uh, in terms of um, providing services, uh, one of the things you mentioned was uh, providing a golden ticket to obtain benefits and uh, the state ID, right? Uh, and so how would you determine the folks who, or how do you separate the folks who can contribute uh, versus the folks who are, uh, we would consider maybe who are uh, chronically um, uh, in need of services, maybe the, perhaps who would, those who would be uh, either mentally ill or would have uh, needs for uh, um, uh, drug rehabilitation uh, versus those who could actually be, uh, those who are actually working probably. Generally, when pe people do come in on intake, we ask um, enough questions to get a good idea of what, first of all, their income is. So if they do have entitlements and they are receiving a check, you know, they're able to share with us, you know, what that is. And we usually ask for the stub to know what they're actually getting. And then if they're working, you know, we also um, acknowledge that and try to accommodate their employment. But if they're not, then, you know, the, the income piece is really important. So based on their income, we find out if they do or do not have money, you know, to be able to pay a portion. And when you think about how much we actually charge at $90 a month or $3 a day, you know, and we, we prorate it sometimes if somebody comes in at the second half of the month so they don't have to pay a full month even. But for someone even on the minimal um, amount of 300, um, about $325 a month, Paying $90 out of that is sort of, you know, it's less than 30%, which is, you know, what we call like affordable housing. But with that, it's not just housing, it's like, you know, meals and everything too, and the case management and stuff. So I think um, we check income. We also determine whether the person does have one of those problems like substance abuse. If they are, they're spending money on alcohol and drugs. And that is one of the um, you know, reasons why we started to say, you know, when I just never charged anything, that if they're spending money on drugs and alcohol, then maybe they can pay something toward their stay at IHS since they are receiving services and, and goods and from us. Okay, and so I guess in terms of uh, recidivism, recidivism, recidivism. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, in terms of you know of of those folks uh, probably having to come back, um, how do you uh, what I guess what is the success rate of somebody being able to actually uh, transition out of uh, IHS and either uh, find a place to live uh, and work or uh, transition into a proper uh, rehabilitation. Uh, facility. We actually have had really um, great statistics that I, I will send to you, you know, about um, people who are th going through the program. If they actually accept services through case management, you know, many of them do get housed. Many of them do end up going through treatment, you know, if they need the treatment. But certainly our community-based case management program that specializes with um, people who have mental illness, we have placed um, a hundred and well, right now we're we're serving about 150 people who are chronically homeless in permanent supportive housing, similar to you know the um, the Housing First program in scattered sites, but they are they are not um, requiring as intensive services maybe than you know some of the other people that we're expecting the Housing First program to serve. So I would say many of them um, you know end up getting housing and staying housed. You know, it, we're, we track the housing retention in our Shelter Plus Care programs, and it runs about, um, I'd say about 85%, you know, that they stay in housing. Okay. Most often, uh, in descending order, least often placements, uh, substance abuse inpatient, residential drug and alcohol treatment. Uh, next would be uh, clean and sober housing. Uh, next would be Shelter Plus Care, folks who qualify with a verifiable disability. Next would be uh, market. Uh, and for families, it would be transitional um, or other um, short-term transitional bridge housing. I think what Jerry's saying is that we use a full spectrum of housing to help 
different people in different situations. And it isn't about just coming to the shelter and that being where they stop. It really is about finding housing. And I think our housing success has been because that is the primary focus for anybody coming to IHS is how can we get this person housed? You know, what is the, the best way to do that? Sometimes it isn't that quick. It's not a quick fix, but we know that if this person is able-bodied, can get a job, that's the track that we're going to go in. You know, we're not going to just say, oh, why don't you go into subsidized housing when the person can work, you know. And I guess of, of the uh, guests who stay at IHS, is it more, um, are they, do they come to you or do you seek them out? Both. Council Member Monaghan, I think you need to come by for a visit. <laughs> I have been. <laughs> All right. It's numerous times. Well, I think, you know, um, we outreach, we, we currently have about 500 people that are being touched by outreach right now. Yes. So that's the people that are out there that we constantly go out to talk to. And 500 plus them. in urban Honolulu and about another 300 in Wahiwa and North Shore combined. And then we, we also, you know, see through the year about 1,400 plus people that actually stay at the shelter. We see um, a lot of people come through the shelter. Some of them are people that have been on the street and then they end up coming to IHS. So it's been, you know, um, different ways that people come to us. But no matter what way they come to us, we'll take them where they're at and really work with them, you know, and really try to find a solution for them. Okay, is there a time limit on how long a person can stay? Not really a time limit per se, but what we try to do is say to the person, look, you know, um, depending upon what their situation is, because some people are there just for less than a month. Some people are there, as Jerry said, like for, you know, three to six months or so. Mm -hmm. But what we try to do is determine what is reasonable and we try to say, okay, what do you want to do? Because we develop a plan that's based on what the person wants and what they're capable of. And then we work with them. And if we find that they're not doing anything and we're working harder than they are to get where they want to go, then we generally say, you know, it doesn't seem like you really want to do this. And we'll just, you know, give them so much time to start demonstrating, you know, kuleana, some responsibility, like goal. You know, if you're able to um, get work, how many interviews have you gone to or you know how many places have you applied at but it gives them the support that they need to just really continue to go look for the things that they need to look for I'm, one of the things I'm most impressed with with uh, IHS is the uh, the children's component that you have uh, in dealing with uh, homeless children and I think that's a very important component to have and um, um, I I guess my question would be, are there, are there chronically homeless who have children as well as uh, maybe work versus working homeless as well who have children and how do you deal with those types of situations? I think in general your question is are there a lot of children out there homeless at this time? Um, oh, well, no, no. Yeah. What is, I'm sorry, could you please rephrase your question? I was well, sure. you know, there, there's a, you know, I'm asking about the separation of working homeless versus uh, those who would need other, perhaps, uh, cr other services, uh, like the chronically uh, homeless, maybe mentally ill, or, or So, or children whose parents are working versus children whose parents are not working and everybody's homeless. I would say at this time, it's about a third would be working. Yeah. Um, and two-thirds not. Uh, most of those f families are in the country, as we mostly know. Mm -hmm. Wainai side, Waimanala side. Um, lots of those families um, are living unsheltered homeless in places where, as you know, it's easy for their kids to walk to school. Um, that's one of the constants that we know. They will cluster where it's close by for their kids to get to school and they can maintain that type of routine. One of the things that I would um, say, though, is that um, for chronically homeless families, um, I'd say because our providers generally prioritize families with children, we really try to take them off the street as soon as possible. If yes. you look at our point in time counts for um, urban Honolulu, we really don't have that many families with children that are on the street. And in Waikiki, it's even less. You can count them on like two hands, I think, you know. So I think that, um, you know, it's really different, as I mentioned, in different parts of the island. And we really try to tailor a solution for each community differently. So do you think by, um by creating this uh, temporary, um, um, I guess this this facility that that we're thinking about, um, do you think it'll provide some relief to IHS and that we would be able to perhaps uh, prioritize the needs of 
uh, certain types of uh, homeless uh, versus the working homeless versus the chronically homeless? I think the key is you know looking at your the population you want to serve, as you mentioned. And if you want to do families only, you know that might be you know something that you might want to consider. But I think that um, even among families, you know, you're going to have some people that may have some substance abuse. But in those particular instances, I do believe that um, the parents, maybe if they're not mired in you know ICE use, um, they might be more motivated, you know, to do something, you know, because they do have children. You know, if there's a if there's a possibility that they might lose their children, a lot of times people end up thinking that okay, maybe I better you know get clean or something like that. It is not uncommon for a family to come into our family dorm who still have a great number of their belongings in their cars. Sometimes they have two cars. Sometimes they're making payments on two cars. Often they've been living in their cars for a few weeks and they just get sick and tired of that and just decide at some point they want to come in. Yeah. Um, so we do see that on a regular basis. And those are working families. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. No, I'm, I think for now that's my, my question is for IHS. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Monahan. Thank you. Okay. Members, we will move into the registered testifiers list. Fiat Gata Memeo, followed by Wellman Tony Walker, followed by Susan Schultz. May if we mono followed by John Tonaki, Office of the Public Defender, followed by Annabelle Murray. Aloha, my name is May Fui Maono. Um, thank you for hearing our testimony in this important matter. I spent the past ten years working in the mental health system here in Hawaii. <coughs> um, I currently do psychiatric assessments in a local ER at the hospital, at one of the hospitals here in Honolulu. Um, since the, the general sweeps have started, uh, we've noticed a drastic increase in people presenting to the ER seeking help. At over $1,000 an ER visit, this isn't really a cheap alternative. With the sit and lie bill on the horizon, um, I foresee an even larger burden on ERs and hospitals in Oahu. It is an un unforeseen yet very real consequence of legislation that targets the most vulnerable population in our community. Housing for people with mental illness and substance abuse in Oahu is extremely hard. Uh, we have about five full-time social workers and that's all they do. And they're, they're busy 40 hours a week just trying to find beds. Um, Steadfast, which is the largest provider, has a two to three year wait list. The LCRS is typically 10 days only, and IHS requires a new referral. So with the, I would like to just say about the new IHS referral for people that they spoke about with a mental illness, they have to have a TB clearance, a referral form filled out by a physician, an ID, and a homeless um, voucher. For many people who are homeless and mentally ill, this is a huge burden. And so these people, we see them repeatedly coming into the hospital. I had one person, I was on a six day stretch. He came in six times because he kept losing it. So, and at $1,000 a visit, $6,000. So I'm just saying that there are better alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions? Okay, if not, uh, John Tonaki. My name is Tony Walker. Please come forward. Uh, Members, in order for us to proceed, we do, due to Sunshine Law, we do need to maintain a quorum. I'd like, the chair would like to appoint Council Member Carol Fukunaga as a member of the committee for purposes of maintaining quorum. And also the same for Council Member Monahan. Thank you. M Mr. Walker, please proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Tony Walker. I'm a 20-year resident of Oahu, graduated Pearl City High School, class of 95, go Chargers. For the last five and a half years, I've worked in the field of human services, providing case management for people experiencing homelessness and people experiencing severe and persistent mental illness. I didn't come here today to bombard you with facts and statistics, nor did I come here to give you anecdotal stories of the hundreds of people that I've worked with in each of your districts. 
I wanted to talk about something that I don't believe gets enough airtime, and that is the moral component to this debate. But first, we have to clarify a couple of things. First, no one chooses to live in poverty. That is a myth, and it's a myth that we should stop perpetuating. Poverty is not something that you choose. Poverty is something that happens to you. Second, the only solution to homelessness is affordable housing. And I'm going to say that again because it doesn't get said enough. The only solution to homelessness is affordable housing. What that means is that when we pass legislation that does not move us in the direction of affordable housing, it is detrimental. You cannot punish people out of poverty. It doesn't work. We have a moral obligation as human beings not to victimize the people in our communities that are not as strong as ourselves. But more than that, we have a higher calling to protect and support those people. And this is your opportunity to do that. These sit-lie bills are not a part of the solution. They are a part of the problem. And it's time to kill them. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Members, any questions? Susan Schultz, Thank you. <clears throat> followed by John Tonaki, followed by Annabelle Murray. Thank you, and I offer up a prayer to the uh, parking authority. Um, <laughs> I don't have enough quarters on me. <laughs> on Oahu, you have the right to be rude. It's called free speech. But if you're homeless, you do not have the right to what's called bad behavior. As the head of IAH, IHS, Connie Mitchell, said to the Star Advertiser the other day, quote, we just think that supporting the bill sets the standard for public behavior. It isn't laws that criminalize people. It's people's behavior that criminalizes them. As a friend of mine responded, it's not guns that kill people. It's the organ damage and blood loss from gunshot wounds that kill people. If we just outlaw those, we'll be fine. On Oahu, you do have the right to sit on the sidewalk in line to buy concert tickets, new iPhones, million dollar condos, or other luxuries, but you don't have the right if you can't go home after. On Oahu, you have the right to shit, but only in a toilet. Given the lack of public facilities, you pretty much need an apartment to go home to. On Oahu, you have the right to get on a wait list for housing, but not to wait in a place where you won't be swept away by the police. On Oahu, you have the right to buy a gun from a large, exquisite display at Sports Authority, but you will not have the right under redrafted Bill 45 to a full night's sleep. Instead, you get 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. free from the sit-lie ban, or just seven hours, which I'm assuming does not equal seven hours of sleep. On Oahu, the Waikiki Tourist Board has the right to strong arm IHS and the City Council into passing these bills before giving $500,000 to help the homeless. Apparently, no one has the right to strong arm them by refusing their blackmail and demanding such help without the strings. On Oahu, you have the right to say that you're a progressive politician when you run for lower or higher office but seemingly you do not have the chutzpah to actually be one when it comes to homelessness. If you don't have a street address or a valid ID, you can't vote, so no need help. Someone counting votes, campaign contributions? Thank you. Members, any questions? John Tonaki? Annabelle Murray? Doug Matsuoka, followed by Max Sword, followed by Scott Johnson. Oh, Scott ain't here. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Chad. Just on procedure, there are five homeless bills. You said you were extending the time for us to speak. I'm sorry? That, do we have five minutes, up to five minutes, to speak on the five homeless bills? No, we're taking all of the bills at once. That's right. So um, at a minute each, that would... That's not correct. We are taking all of the bills at once as one single item. Uh, are, are speakers allowed to speak up to five minutes? No. How, how long is the speaking time? The speaking time, as I announced at the beginning of the hearing, is one minute. We've, we've taken these bills and put them into one agenda. 
as you can see, when the buzzer goes off, we have been liberal. I haven't cut anybody off yet. Doing my best to be as liberal as possible with the time limit allowed. Mr. Matsuoka, please proceed. Yes, aloha, Chair Anderson and the uh, committee. For the record, my name is H. Doug Matsuoka, the Hawaii Gorilla Video Hui. I uh, strongly oppose the mayor's uh, criminalization bills being considered <coughs> today, namely bills 42, 43, 45, 46, and 48, I believe. I submitted a uh, written testimony, which I won't repeat, other than to note that I have uh, video documentation of the midnight raids on the homeless, which includes footage of Ross Sasamura and Jun Yang, okay? And those were done under Bill 7 or ROH 13-8, as it's known now. Um, I do want to bring up a couple of points that the mayor knows and that you know and that I know, but that the public might not know. And one is uh, the mayor knows that the bills are not about criminal behavior. They're about how much justice you can afford. Subparagraph B8 of the sit-lie bills allow you to sit in line, camp out overnight if you're there to buy the new iPhone. Okay, if you're not there to buy the new iPhone, you can't do it. Specifically, it exempts those waiting for goods and services. You'd think that if you're waiting for affordable housing, that would qualify you. I'm sure the police wouldn't cut you any slack on that. So if you can't afford the new iPhone, you can't afford justice. It's a, it's a, it's a price a lot of people can't pay. Two, the mayor knows that the laws won't clear the sidewalks because bad policy, and that's previous bad policy, and and current bad public, uh, public policy has created a potentially inexhaustible supply of homeless people. L let me read something. Okay, this is a quote. Right now we have a big, long waiting list in public housing, a huge waiting list in the affordable housing developments. And there's really nothing between those affordable housing rentals and the market. The difference is so great that we see these huge wait lists in our public housing of 10 years. 10,000 people on the wait list. We have hundreds and thousands of people on our other private developer wait list. Those aren't my words, those are the words of Jun Yang, okay? And that's at 10 minutes, 20 seconds on the Civil Cafe um, uh, panel that he was on. That's up on YouTube, you can catch it. Okay, now we have to remember that it's homelessness that's the problem, not the homeless. So the solution has, has gone beyond the homelessness, it's, and it's really simple. We have to produce public policy that uses public assets for the public good and not for private profit. Okay, now can the current council produce such policy? You know, that's an open question for people interested in governance in candidates and elections and that sort of thing. Mr. Matsuoka, please summarize okay, and I conclude know, your testimony. To summarize, I know that uh, people are thinking, and you're aware that the electorate knows that the homeless problem has gone beyond how we treat the homeless. It's about affordable housing, as someone has mentioned before. Um, so I'm asking you to do the right thing, reject the mayor's bills criminalizing homelessness, and start working on arresting homelessness. I mean. Stop the criminalization of the homeless, but start working on arresting homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any, any questions? questions for Mr. Muscle? Thank you very much. Max Sword, followed by Scott Johnson, followed by the Reverend Stephen Costa. I was to say uh, good morning. I guess it's still morning. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Max Sword, Outrigger Hotels, in support of the... Uh, yeah, my testimony in support of Bill 42 and 43. Um, while we understand the issue of uh, homelessness is uh, something that uh, everyone needs to work on, uh, however, in Waikiki, we ha the problem is getting worse every day. Um, and the old adage that, uh, you know, it's don't chew off too much uh, more than, uh, bite off more than you can chew, we're suggesting that uh, probably just start with the Waikiki area that's more manageable, uh, and from there expand out to the other reasons and learn from what, uh, what Waikiki has to offer. Uh, we've gotten to the point now where uh, our hotel on the beach, um, Outrigger Waikiki, we're now having to key, uh, lock the uh, doors for the restrooms. Uh, 
The restrooms are normally open for um, uh, those that go to the beach and everything. Uh, but then uh, we've had a problem with homeless uh, people going in and just trashing the bathrooms. Uh, I understand that has happened also at a couple of other uh, hotels along the way. So uh, we urge a passage of the bill so that uh, at least uh, we can start moving in the right direction for Waikiki. Thank you. Open to any questions if you have any. Uh, Mr. Sword. Yes. Are the businesses in Waikiki prepared to partner with the city and the nonprofit community towards uh, providing aid yes. to, this, to these issues? Yeah, yes. Um, we, Waikiki, it's uh, Outrigger Waikiki, uh, Outrigger Hotels uh, has been uh, partnering with the community center in Waikiki for that type of issue. Now, you can only speak uh, for Outrigger Hotels. Correct? Yeah, but okay. uh, with that being said, we have also committed to uh, supporting uh, uh, Waikiki Improvement Association, I, I believe, Rick is here and he can answer uh, specifically to the others as well. But uh, we've decided that, uh, folk, you know, instead of having uh, 100 chefs in the, uh, the, the, the kitchen, so to speak, to uh, attack this problem, we've, all, we've focused it through WIA. So WIA is handling everything and we have made the commitment to uh, uh, do things like uh, work with the city to at least open one restroom on uh, uh, Kuhio, uh, uh, Kuhio Beach. Um, but all the other specifics, uh, Rick has, is the one that's been coordinating it that for the hotel. But we are committed to uh, the, the short answer to your question, Mr. Chair. Okay. Members, any questions for Mr. Sword? Council Member Monahan. If we do, if we do push forward with this, um, with what we're proposing in Sand Island, it would, uh, I think, tremendously help the uh, Waikiki uh, or serve you folks, the, the industry, which I have concerns with as well. I mean, in terms of uh, uh, homelessness affecting the industry. Oh, you're asking the question? Uh, yeah. Well, well the, you got to understand the homelessness in Waikiki are not families. Uh, the, I think the majority, and, and Rick can probably uh, uh, give you better statistics on that, but a vast majority is all like singles. In other words, you know, single guys, single women, uh, or, or just a pair. They're, they're really not families. So that's reason, one of the reasons why uh, if we start with Waikiki, it's, it's more manageable. Now, how does affect uh, what you're proposing? Um, I don't know. I w would have to take a look at, at, at that. But uh, we, we believe that the system now can handle the issue in Waikiki and, uh, and, and make it uh, progress uh, uh, in a positive manner. Well, I guess the question I was trying to ask was, um, would you be willing to direct some of those resources towards that effort in Sand Island? Um, might be open to that, but we have to sit down and uh, talk and see how, how far we can go with that. But, uh, that, but we're, uh, again, to uh, answer the question, we are committed to uh, taking care of the homeless in uh, Waikiki. Thank you very much. Thanks. Members, any further questions for Mr. Sword? Thank you very much. Thank you. The Reverend Stephen Costa, followed by Rick Egged, followed by Janet Grace. Aloha once again. Um, I came last time that you had these council meetings. Um, my, my dear old friend Jerry uh, mentioned uh, Father Dutillo. I cannot imagine Father Dutillo. I, I don't, I'm one of the few people here that knew him. I cannot imagine that Father Dutillo was happy with this. I know that the glory of my God is not happy with this. Mm -hmm. I am saddened that we have come this far in my beautiful state that we would criminalize people because we hold them down. I, I just wanted to say how much I am against this and, and, I, and, I, and I pray that, uh, that the Holy Spirit touches your hearts that you will squash this bill and never bring it up again. Okay. Members, any questions for the Reverend? Thank you, Reverend. Rick Egged, followed by Janet Grace, followed by Jenny Lee. Hello, Chair Anderson, Vice Chair Harimoto, members of the council. Uh, my name is Rick Egan. I'm the president of the Waikiki Improvement Association. And we're here only to testify on bills 42 and 43, the ones that pertain to Waikiki. We do support both of these bills. We think it's important that the sidewalks, the busiest sidewalks in the state, in Waikiki, are kept open for their major, for their primary purpose, which is of course to get from one place to another. 
they're not meant to be housing for anyone. And, uh, you know, it's sad, I think, and I agree with probably almost all the speakers that homelessness is a, is a major issue for our entire community. I live in Kaka'ako, so I work in Waikiki, I live in Kaka'ako, two of probably of the hottest areas for the homeless issue. And so uh, it, is a, it's a, it is a crisis for the entire community. And uh, one thing I do want to correct, it wasn't in our testimony because our testimony really just pertained to the two bills, but I, I, I think the, um, the one incorrect the previous speaker alluded to it, uh, inference that was made by the newspaper article that came out was that there was, there's no linkage to what we've been do, talking about with the IHS in these two bills. They're not linked at all. The, the uh, discussion with IHS began because we did a forum. I'm, I'm sorry, I'll quickly summarize. We did a forum. Uh, no, no, your time is up when I say it, so please oh, proceed. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, we did a forum uh, for our members at our mid-year meeting. We asked IHS, we asked the Waikiki Health Center, and we asked Queen's Emergency to come and talk to us about this, the, the chronic homeless problem, the people who, who are really uh, the most uh, endangered by being on the streets, you know, the people with mental illness, drug abuse issues, and, and uh, other uh, disabilities. And coming out of that meeting, IHS made a put together kind of a comprehensive package to try to help to address those individuals in Waikiki. And I don't want, really want to talk about the details of the package because it's their package. It's, it's not WIA's package. WIA is actually just trying to facilitate the meetings with the Waikiki stakeholders. And then we will, we're, we're currently in discussion about the best way to raise money uh, for this. And, Thank you. But there's no direct linkage with that initiative and these bills. Thank There's you. no linkage. I, I have one question. I'm sure members may have uh, others for you, so I'll just ask one question of you. In regards to what the WBIA is putting together, can you tell us what you're committing to as far as money and what the priorities of the package are? Well, the, the package will include uh, keeping the, uh, I think the, actually it's a, a partnership between the BI, BID and the Business Improvement District Association in the city. And uh, for a period of, of a, a test period, they're going to keep the restrooms open uh, between the, um, uh, at the police substation for 24 hours. The idea is that the concern being that if we outlaw urination and defecation public, there should be a place for people to go 24 hours a day. And so that was the idea behind keeping this restroom open. And the first basic uh, purpose is to see, you know, during this period, how the restroom survives because it won't have any direct attendance during that period, whether more resources would then be necessary in order to keep it open, uh, how, how much usage actually takes place during that period. Uh, and, uh, and so that's what the, the BID is, is committed to doing, is to working with the city to keeping on the, the restroom open. And um, I, I don't want to comment directly on the, on the sources of, of funding because, frankly, I'm not okay. uh, So you're not prepared to offer a dollar amount at this time? That. No, I mean, okay. that would have to come from the city and from the BID because okay. they're the ones working on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, uh, questions for Mr. Aiken? Vice Chair Harimoto? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Aiken, thank you very much for coordinating and making some kind of commitment. As you know, the first time this came to committee, I, I pretty much raked you folks over the coals for not having commitment. So I, I wanted to say thank you very much. I think whatever you can do to help uh, is very much appreciated. So thank you. But um, so you're saying, you know, I read in the newspaper that there was a $500,000 commitment. Um, I don't think that that's what this article said. The uh, I, I what somewhere. the request was for was is request? was for from IHS. They put together a program to address uh, the, the homeless needs in Waikiki. And I'd rather, again, have them talk about the details because it's, it's not a WIA program, it's an IHS program. What WIA's role in it is, is, is in trying to facilitate the, the discussions with the Waikiki stakeholders and then maybe in cooperation, the current discussion is in cooperation with the, the uh, um, HLTA to do a fundraising effort to raise the funds for it. 
It would include intensive outreach in Waikiki, a shuttle to promote access between Waikiki and, and IHS and the shelter services. Uh, you know, the idea of creating teams that would go around and talk to the, the, the individuals in Waikiki to, to kind of do a triage and try and help them get signed up to, to programs. Uh, the, and the idea too to, would be to specifically tie it to the cities and the states housing first program with goals to putting people in housing. So, uh, you know, not just more social services, if you will, or even health services, but specifically tied to uh, getting people into housing. And try to, I mean, the, this kind of money, you talk about even a half a million dollars, it's hard to raise a half a million dollars, I'm sure all of you know that. But nevertheless, when the whole scheme of things, it's not a lot of money. Now, you folks have put up the, the real money out of the, out of the city's coffers. So what we're looking for is just to kind of help facilitate getting the, the folks in Waikiki connected to those programs. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Chair, I, I guess either the newspaper article was, was incorrect or I misunderstood it, but um, I guess during the discussion, if we could ask um, IHS to uh, talk a little bit more about that, I would appreciate it. Certainly, at the thank conclusion you. of uh, public yeah. testimony thank after you. everybody has the opportunity, definitely. Uh, members, any further questions for Mr. Egan? No, my, my question was answered in, in the previous question. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Janet Grace, Jenny Lee, oh, here we go. Please come forward. Hi, my name is Jenny Lee, and I'm a staff attorney with Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice. We submitted fairly extensive written testimony, so I would just like to um, touch on a variety, um, highlight some of the issues, as well as begin by thanking you sincerely for the commitment that you made earlier this year to tackling homelessness in a profound, meaningful way and helping the most vulnerable members of our community and also um, taking on a best practice. So we've begun laying a very solid foundation for actually ending homelessness, specifically um, targeted at the people experiencing chronic homelessness. However, um, I strongly urge you that we continue on that track and not pat defer these bills because of many of the issues that have already been touched on, but um, a few that I'd like to bring up um, specifically in terms of the legal issues, I would caution that there are a number of ambiguities in these ordinances that um, particularly with regard to medical exemptions and expressive activity that do make them vulnerable to an as-applied challenge. Obviously, any kind of defense of this law is costly. And that brings me to one of the other major points is that criminalization is generally, the, um, it's been found to be the least effective yet the most expensive approach to ending homelessness. We could easily house somebody in an apartment uh, for much cheaper than the cost of incarceration. I'd also like to note that with the issue of adequate housing placements through Housing First or emergency shelter beds or even uh, encampment, that is um, presumably going to be far less, even with potentially depending on the encampment size or not. But in terms of Housing First and emergency shelters, there are far more people who are living unsheltered right now um, and so even with the RFP out, that's I believe is about 100, so that's certainly not going to be sufficient. Um, it is, I'd like to reiterate that affordable housing truly is the issue. Housing first is one of the key solutions. Again, um, I want to thank you again for the choices that you made earlier this year and urge you that we continue to effectively address homelessness so that we can end it. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions? If not, Catherine Jean, followed by Brian Brigier, followed by Joanne Adams. Thank you, members of the council, for this opportunity to testify. Um, is the clerk here that can pass this out? There's a study here from UC Berkeley Policy Advocacy Clinic that was done in 2012. I think you might find very interesting, along with a petition of almost a thousand signers that are opposed to this bill, these bills, especially the sit and lie. 
Now, what the research report does is it covers 19 jurisdictions that have implemented sit and lie laws, including seven in California. And what they found was, and it's there in black and white, as Jenny Lee said, that these laws are not effective and it, they show no increase in economic activity or increase in homeless services. Um, and so they only, what they do is they prolong homelessness and they also tax the taxpayers because they're very costly. Now what that presents is that th these measures are not only unconstitutional as applied or as they're enforced, uh, which opens you up to lawsuits, which my organization will be committed and forced to uh, help if these laws are passed, um, but they also create an unfunded mandate. As Bill 7, in years past, the sidewalk uh, nuisance law, had unforeseen costs attached to it that we now know total millions of dollars per year in the enforcement um, of the sweeps, not, to not even including the storage fees, this law, these, all of these sit and lie laws, will incur millions of dollars in costs that are not actually addressed in this bill. And for that reason alone, this bill, not j in the minimum level, needs a rewrite. Uh, not to mention, I'd like to underscore over and over again, that even though the mayor said that this, the Ninth Circuit Court uh, said that the Seattle law passed constitutional muster as written, what he didn't know, probably, <laughs> is that the full decision, the Ninth Circuit Court underscored that if these laws were challenged as applied or as they were actually enforced against homeless people, these constitutional challenges would be successful. That equals hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees that you would have to pay out because of this ordinance. Um, you would also have to reflect on the accurate number of unsheltered houseless in the Honolulu area. Now, according to the national point in time count, that's 785. Now, the UH did a study in 2013 as well, um, the Center on the Family, and their count is much higher for those who have accessed um, houseless services. The unsheltered amount almost totals 3,200. Now, your RFP providing for an increase in housing first, though it's a step in the right direction, will not adequately address the um, the entire population of unsheltered houses or chronically ho houseless. So the issue of shelters is really a moot issue. They can't address this problem, and they shouldn't have to address this problem. Uh, the issue is affordable housing. Now, as far as IHS is concerned, and I'll wrap it up, I know I have run out my time. Um, there, there, you do require fees. I was there myself. Uh, as you heard testimony from a worker in the ER, they require ID, uh, TB clearance, which could be obtained after admission, of course, they give you some time, but also a letter of homelessness and a fee. Now this fee was paid uh, for by my agency. I have it on videotape that it was a requirement on the spot that this fee be paid or else my clients would not be able to enter. I have it on a recording. Also what I have on tape, or actually a picture that was sent to, us, to, to me by a staff member that I won't mention, is several bed bugs in this picture mm -hmm. that still exist in the shelter. Um, also I'd like to point out that the policies from IHS itself state that, and this is in the guest house rules, page two, you need to pay for the shelter fees. You will be asked to leave if you do not pay. It's right here, okay? Even though you have the right to clean services, which they don't have clean services because of the bed bugs, you also have uh, the right to the access of information, which they don't have access to information because through these savings accounts <coughs> that Jerry mentioned, he didn't mention that they take out actual individual savings accounts and then give people access to their own account numbers. They're not given access to their account numbers. All they're given is a receipt that they're responsible for keeping upon exit, and once they exit or are discharged from the facility, then they're given what they paid into a, the account minus the um, interest. Now, in economic terms, this is completely unethical, okay? You cannot trust the word of an embellished social service who has an economic incentive to pass these criminalization bills. <coughs> you have forced, you will be forcing this once honest and good social service to become economically dependent upon the criminalization and the future perpetuation of the criminalization of their own clients. And as a social service provider, 
quoting the ethics of the National uh, Social Work Society, Association of Social Workers, that in itself contradicts that being, contradicts everything that that social service is supposed to stand for. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions? Uh, Ms. Jian, Council Member Manahan has a question. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Kat, Enjoy. for being here today. And I, I really appreciate your testimony. And, sure. Uh, you know, um, from, from, I guess, the, the committee's standpoint, um, you know, it, it's, 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 these are difficult bills to tackle. And it, it, these are tough issues. Uh, but these are difficult decisions that, that I think need to be made. And I'm not, I'm not crazy about it personally either. But you know, you, you've seen, you know, you've seen the, the problem here. I, I respect you for, for being out there firsthand and, and being on the front line of this issue. What do we need? What more do we need to be able to, to um, in your opinion, to be able to solve uh, the homelessness issue? rather than criminalize homeless. What has proved to work, if you look at the sit and lie study, and it's a very quick read, uh, they propose uh, solutions that have already worked in addressing homelessness. Now, the sit and lie has proven not to work. It's gone backwards. It's actually um, uh, works against those who try to end homelessness. What does work are several programs like Housing First, um, Street to uh, Housing from New York, um, square one from Berkeley, those are already established models of housing and housing uh, projects like Housing First that have proven to work. Why, why, cannot, why can't we uh, invest in those? And that just takes a little bit more time, but in the long run, it will help those who are potentially at risk of being criminalized with a criminal record, which would make it more difficult to get a job or anything. Um, then, you know, focus on this. And with, I, all we're asking you is maybe another year to get these projects off of the ground. There's no reason to focus on the immediate need that the Waikiki businesses are saying that are affecting their economy, which is not proven. You have no actual studies to make this an empirical statement, none whatsoever. And the costs constitutionally as well as morally are very dire. You not only have the constitution against you, you also have God. There are a lot of, there are a lot of people from interfaith churches from all over, like Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, Please, they're all telling you the moral grounds on this is, is firm and established, and please don't interrupt that. Thank you. Oh, well, I would like to finally say that the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, or USICH, in 2010 strongly advised local governments to refrain from enacting laws that criminalize homelessness. They asserted that such criminalization fails to increase access to services, they themselves and tend to create additional barriers between homeless people and access to housing, income, and employment. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any further questions? Brian Brazier, followed by Scott Johnson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the council. My name is Brian Brazier. Um, I'm here today to oppose these bills wearing three different hats, really. First off, as a human being. Second off, as a resident of Waikiki and a taxpayer. And third off, as the civil rights and constitutional law attorney who has spent the better part of a thousand hours challenging what are known as Bill 7 and Bill 54. Um, and I'm currently seeking over $200,000 in attorney's fees from the city in response to those lawsuits. So I think I know a little bit about what I'm talking about here. <laughs> As a human being, I think these laws are morally reprehensible. I think they're absolutely unconscionable, as many other members have testified, and I'm sure many more will. Um, the managing director, Shin, said the purpose is not to criminalize uh, homelessness. I don't see how she can say that with a straight face, given that that's exactly what it does. It criminalizes human existence. That's what it does. As a resident and a taxpayer, it bothers me that when I hear that $15,000 is spending on each one of these sweeps to steal property from homeless people. I have no idea what it's going to cost to incarcerate people under these bills when that inevitably happens, but it's not going to be cheap. That money is better spent to lift people up rather than drive them down. It's better spent trying to get them to be productive members of our community rather than criminalizing them and giving them a criminal record that eventually prevents them from having a productive existence. The state of Utah, in a Housing First program, has said on the record that they will have eradicated houselessness in the state of Utah by 2015. Eradicated it. Gone. 
as a constitutional law attorney, these laws are not going to pass constitutional muster. The Seattle law that the mayor referred to is fundamentally different in scope in that it covers a much narrower geographic re region and it covers much narrower hours of the day. These aren't going to pass. And I can promise you it's not whether, it's not if, it's only when I bring a lawsuit to challenge these bills if you guys pass them. It's going to happen. So I strongly encourage you not to pass these bills because not only are they morally reprehensible, not only will they be extremely expensive, not only will they not work, but they're going to lose and you're going to pay me to challenge them. <laughs> Members, any questions? Thank you. Scott Johnson? Oh, he, he uh, left. He talked to Ms. Oakley. Okay. Joanne Adams? Followed by Scott Morishige, followed by Larry Geller. My name is Joanne Adams. And I'm a member of the Waikiki Board, but I'm here as a resident of Waikiki. And I'm speaking in support of Bill 42, and I would like to see it amended to include the portions of 48. The people here in the audience keep trying to confuse the issue by bringing in all of homelessness when this bill is about sitting and lying on a sidewalk. And I emphasize sidewalk. It's a sidewalk, not a side sit, not a side lie. It's a sidewalk. It has been designed for the express purpose so that pedestrians can move from point A to point B, which in Waikiki is critical because if you're forced off the sidewalk, we have tremendous traffic problems and you are likely to be injured. And any given day, there are over 100,000 people in Waikiki. This is not the wild, wild west. We don't have room for the wild, wild west. And as we know, as the west was settled, laws were increasingly proposed. We cannot afford the idea that, well, you don't like rules, you don't have to abide by them, not in Waikiki. Thank you for letting me testify. Thank you. Members, any questions for Ms. Adams? Uh, Ms. Adams, just one question, if you, if you would. What is your profession? I'm an attorney. And I'd like to say, if I can add just one quick one, my condo, and you, most of you know me because I'm so politically involved, my condo does not allow me to hang a single political poster in my window. Do you think that irritates me? Yes. Do I comply? Yes. Thank you for being here, Ms. Adams. Thank you. Scott Morishige, followed by Larry Geller, followed by Lisa Kimeyer. Good afternoon, um, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Scott Morishige. I'm the Executive Director of FOCUS, which is a membership, a member, membership and advocacy organization for health and human service nonprofits. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on the bills before you today. Um, specifically, I wanted to um, provide further information on a recent initiative that FOCUS has been centrally involved in called Haleo Malama, which is a joint initiative that began roughly um, a little under a year ago um, between HUD, um, the city and county, the state homeless programs office, the Hawaii Interagency Council on Homelessness, and the VA, as well as Oahu's homeless service providers, including IHS, as well as Waikiki Health, and many others. Uh, FOCUS role in the Haleoma Lama Initiative is to be the data collector um, and data analysis hub for information collected to this joint effort. The effort is really largely focused on um, increasing the level of knowledge and understanding that we have regarding homeless individuals in our community so that based on data, we can better craft um, better programs and policies to help this um, population. Since um, March, we've implemented um, assessments I believe the managing director had referred to um, in her testimony, um, island-wide of roughly 830 homeless individuals and families across the island. Um, based on the data, what we found is about a third of these individuals, 32% um, or 271 um, individuals, indicate a need for permanent supportive housing, such as Housing First, which is not just housing, but it's housing as well as very intensive support services. Um, of these individuals, they're very heavily concentrated in the downtown Honolulu and Waikiki areas. Around 71% of them um, reside in those communities. Um, 
to just give an example of the vulnerability of this population, what we've found from our data is looking at those individuals in the PSH category, 100% of them report a disabling condition that prevents them from being able to work. Um, about 78% of them have been victims of violent <coughs> attacks on the street since becoming homeless. Around 70% of them have been victim victimized by their friends or family who have taken their possessions once these individuals have become homeless on the street. And about 95% of them indicate um, some type of substance use um, need. So as you can tell, you know, this population is very highly vulnerable and has both medical as well as you know, substance use issues that require very specialized um, treatment. Another thing we wanted to point out is based on the data, we are also seeing um, these individuals have been um, on the street for a very long period of time. Of those in the PSH category, um, the average length of time that they've been unsheltered, so not in an emergency shelter, but unsheltered on the street is eight years. Um, and their average age is about 61 years old. So these are older individuals who've been living unsheltered on the street for a very long time with very um, you know, severe needs. Um, Another thing that FOCUS has been involved um, in, in this effort, in addition to collecting the assessment data, is we actually also track the emergency shelter vacancy rate data that the managing director also referred to. Um, so based on this data, what we found is right now, um, there's about, like she mentioned, uh, 54 emergency shelter bed spaces currently available in the um, Honolulu and Waikiki area, but those are primarily bed spaces for individuals. The emergency um, shelter spaces for families are largely filled. I mean, in fact, IHS's um, Women and Family Shelter is always filled when we receive the vacancy report data from them, and then many times they're actually above capacity. So the, where there is um, shelter bed spaces for individuals, um, there's about 54 bed spaces on average um, in the Honolulu Waikiki area, and the remainder is largely in uh, Waipahu at the Lighthouse Outreach Shelter, which averages about 40 open bed spaces on average, as well as um, Waianae Community Outreach's um, Kealoho West Oahu Shelter, which averages about 35 bed spaces available on average. Um, I just wanted to you know, be able to share this um, information with the council as you're considering the policies before you today. And just to keep in mind that, um, you know, although there are many new resources coming available um, to assist this population, such as the State Housing First contract, the um, SAMHSA grant for Housing First, as well as City Housing First efforts, a lot of these programs are fairly new and just beginning to launch now. So it's going to take some time for them to really be up and running where they'll be able to meet the needs of the individuals that we're surveying. Um, so I just wanted to share this information with you and I'd be happy to answer if you guys have any questions. Thank you. Okay. Members, any questions? Council Member Fukunaga. Thank you. You know, um, I appreciate focus. Uh, data collection efforts, and I'm curious as to whether or not you have uh, the data broken down by smaller subregions. For example, Waikiki versus downtown Chinatown versus Ala Moana, et cetera. We, we have it broken down to um, East Honolulu from um, P.E. Koi Street to Hawaii Kai, and then I think um, what we consider downtown Honolulu is P.E. Koi up to Salt Lake. So that's the best that we can isolate it down right now. Um, if you break down that 71% that I mentioned, um, the bulk of those are actually located in the um, downtown urban Honolulu area. Um, uh, many, many of the individuals surveyed are in the uh, River Street, Fort Street Mall area. That's, that would be my conclusion as well. And so when, you know, when we talk about the 71%, I would imagine that most of the ones that you are referring to are the ones in the downtown Chinatown area because they do tend to be older. You know, many of them do have substance abuse and mental health challenges. And so that is one reason why, you know, much of our efforts at the local level have focused on the kind of housing and the kinds of programs and services that would be appropriate for that population. Whereas my sense is that in the Waikiki area, some of the population that you're, you know, really talking about in Waikiki and other parts of East Honolulu is different from that downtown Chinatown population. I think in, in general, the number of homeless individuals that we've surveyed from the Waikiki area um, has been very limited in comparison to the number of individuals okay. surveyed in 
um, downtown urban Honolulu. Okay. But many other individuals also migrate between the two communities. Yes, we know that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Menor. Just for clarification, you know, uh, council members are concerned that if these kinds of bills, the civil bills are passed, that, um, you know, the homeless population impacted by these bills need to have shelter spaces to go to. So from your perspective, again, for clarification, if, if the bills that we are considering were enacted into law, do you feel that um, there are adequate shelter spaces for these homeless individuals? I think, well, there are um, shelter spaces that are available right now. Like um, I mentioned, um, they're primarily um, bed spaces for individuals. And the majority of that are vacancies at the IHS um, Sumner Street Men's Shelter. Um, I think even if um, these laws were implemented, that those bed spaces would probably continue to have similar vacancy rates for various reasons. Um, because again, I think the population being impacted is you know, very vulnerable with very severe needs, some of which might not be able to be um, adequately addressed within the structured nature of a shelter environment but might be able to be um, better addressed through outreach or linkages with, you know, with other types of programs. So I think even if these laws are implemented, um, and while these bed spaces exist, I don't think that it would necessarily follow that those individuals would then move into those shelter spaces. Okay, thank you. Members, any further questions? Thank you very much. Larry Geller, followed by Lisa Kimeyer, followed by Isaiah Chong. My name is Larry Geller. I'm testifying today as an individual. Um, you have my written testimony that I uh, submitted via the website, but um, I'd like to start with something else. I, uh, when, I, when I heard the uh, managing director say that Hawaii is in the vanguard of housing first, I bristled. This is 2014, folks. Housing First has been around since maybe 2004, 2005, or even earlier. So thank you for your free Wi-Fi. I Googled it. And I think this is really important. I, I, I want you to know that uh, this isn't frivolous. Housing First or similar programs are the key to something I think everybody in this room wants, which is a reduction in homelessness for the benefit of everybody, the people involved, the tourist industry, everyone in, uh, in this case in Honolulu. We all want that. Okay, uh, Housing First, the first hit, Denver, 2006. The study, this is a cost study that found that uh, emergency room visits and costs were reduced an average of 34.3%. Hospital inpatient um, costs reduced 66%. Detox visits were reduced 82%. Um, and finally, uh, incarceration, incarceration days and costs were reduced by 76%. 77% of those entering the program continued to be housed in the program after two years. Folks, this is evidence. This stuff works. The next hit was Utah that was mentioned. and it, it Just Google goes on and on. Um, that's what works. Now, bless the IHS folks for what they do. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. But... That's not the solution for Honolulu, nor are the uh, bills before you. You've heard adequate testimony, I think, that they work the other way. Now, I, as a taxpayer, um, object to you taking stuff out of my money out of my wallet at night while I'm asleep for things that don't work. I think everybody should be concerned. These bills will increase our costs. You're going to not just face lawsuits. They basically, you're foregoing the benefits that you would have if we had a Housing First program. By the Housing First, I don't mean putting 50 or 100 people into Housing First. That's what you heard here. That's what you've read. We need a Housing First program that provides an adequate program to make the difference, to produce the numbers, to produce the results we want. We don't have that yet. It's maybe to come, but we don't have it. Okay, so what's the rush on passing these bills? Um, to get in, just quickly dive into my testimony. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, there's no rush, folks. We've, we've seen pressure in the newspaper, complaints on the front page about what's going on on the streets. 
uh, the editor selects letters to the editor that are complaining. Okay, well, check out today's paper. You have to dig for it. What they don't tell you is that Hawaii sets records. Uh, July set an uh, all-time record for both visitor spending and arrivals. So where's the evidence that this is hurting tourism? I personally believe it will one day affect tourism if nothing's done. But you're going to do something about it, aren't you? So instead of rushing headlong into this because of pressure from the tourist industry, oh, and I thank them for the one bathroom. I, th I think <laughs> one bathroom. Come on, folks. Let's get real with what it's going to take. This is nothing easy. It's going to take a real commitment from each of you as, as our leaders and as our legislators. And several of you, by the way, have experience over at the state legislature, I remember. So maybe you could walk across the street and light a fire under them because many of the services that are necessary to make Housing First work and to reduce homelessness in Hawaii are a state responsibility. In fact, the number of people on the street with mental illness uh, today, and I don't know how to classify that number, but a large portion of that I hold are as a result of state cuts in mental health services that occurred between 2007 and the present time that dumped people out of supportive services, the, uh, the wraparound services that were keeping them in their home and that would be necessary to make Housing First work when implemented in, in uh, Honolulu. The Department of Health cut those services. They also cut intensive uh, case management from as much as uh, 30 hours a month if necessary down to three and a half hours. And while there are no statistics, those people were dumped out into the street. In order to move people from the street back into either Housing First or affordable housing, the state needs to make a complete about face and restore the mental health services that support people and keep them in housing. Um, so there's no rush. What you're doing, I mean, just an end summary here. Um, we need to get every bit of this in place. We need those mental health services, which you can't provide. The state needs to. It won't work unless they're provided. Uh, we need not to have you pass these bills. We need you to wait until there's housing first. And we need you not to wait for housing first. We need you to push them and get real housing first. You Thank won't you. need these bills. And we don't need the lawsuits. And I don't need you taking any money out of my pocket for um, <laughs> lawsuits. And by the way, I, I have on uh, my Disappeared News blog photos that passerbyers gave me of garbage trucks attending these raids. And Doug has videos posted of garbage trucks at the raids. The IDs, the medicine, the personal belongings have gone into those garbage trucks and are not retrievable. I have spoken to people. One woman had her colostomy bag thrown into the garbage truck, and that made the newspaper. And this is the solution to homelessness. So please... Get behind Housing First. Help it happen. We, 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 I, I know there's, you know, there, there's summits, there are committees, there are working groups. Whatever it takes, let's get to Housing First with a real budget, with real people assigned to tasks to put people in housing, to find those houses wherever it is. Real people, real budget, real timelines. When you've got a timeline in front Thank of you, you much. then you can look at these bills. Thank you. Members, any questions? Lisa Kemar, followed by Isaiah Chong, followed by Kahu Kaleo Patterson. If you have a visual, you could set that up on the easel right next to the television camera. Thank you very much, too. Thank you. Um, Lisa K. Meyer, Master's in Clinical Psychology, work as a mental health specialist. Um, also, currently, it's part of um, my schooling and hours. I also um, work in therapy with a lot of families who are homeless. Um, so, on the on the far right, the demographics, I mean, we've heard a lot of statistics. We know what um, it's composed of. We've seen the kind of um, point in time counts. But I just wanted to remind you guys that, you know, when we think about who the homeless is, why these bills were created, 
who irritates us. We often think about the, mental, the mentally ill, the schizophrenic, the dirty guy, the guy holding the sign, he's on drugs, he's wanting to do a marijuana research study. That's what we think of. Um, that takes up 20% or less of the population. It takes up really, you know, a lot of the t testimony, when you count it out, they're not really counting much of who the homeless really are. Oh my God, already? Um, and so we have to remember, okay, so maybe only four, we're assuming only four children or two children in Waikiki. We have said that this would be a model right for the whole island so even if there's only four children in Waikiki there still are four children and those families with those children in Waikiki that will be affected the elderly 21 percent veterans 385 people a lot of them are in Waikiki actually the physically di disabled we tend to forget that a lot of them are physically disabled unable to work uh, unable to get their own housing. Um, you know, sometimes that's what happens. Their only choice is to sleep on the road. That's what they're doing. It's their only choice, and we forget about them. It's 13% to 56%. We don't really have much Hawaii studies, but nationally, it's within that range, and we see it with our own eyes a lot in Hawaii. Um, up to 85% total of the whole homeless population have some kind of cognitive. Cognitive can be Alzheimer's. It can be your traumatic brain injuries, um, and learning disabilities, developmental disabilities, all these things that pretty much make it hard for them to access resources, make it hard for them to maintain the things that we expect of them to access, to do. Um, Please summarize and conclude your testimony. Okay. Um, so this is just a brief breakdown of the total um, mental, mental illness um, of the to ho total homeless population based on national and Hawaii studies. So the severely mentally ill, about 20%. Anxiety, 25%. Um, mood, that's like your depression, um, bipolar, 25%. Um, so we you know, we tend to forget about the anxiety and mood disorders. It was briefly mentioned that a lot of these bills that's been passed in other cities, you've seen a lot of um, increases in the inpatient, um, in the ER services. We've also seen a lot of suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, suicidal ideation within the 60 percentile, 29 to 30 percent in the attempts. Thank so you very we are much. pushing people over, you know, the cliff here. That severe, sorry, that severe part, that's 20%, we're gonna increase that. As the other, the anxiety and just depression, which is still serious in itself, are gonna move Thank into that. Thank you very that. much. Thank you. Um, and I've gotta ask you to conclude your testimony. Members, do we have any questions? So although these, the purpose of these bills, in theory, it's admirable. I've gotta ask you to conclude your testimony. I've been more than oh, liberal yeah, yeah. at the time. Was, Thank you. Oh, Unless anyone has trying. any questions. Oh wait, so I. I Oh, I'm done, done now. I thought you said conclude. I need you to, con I need <laughs> okay. you to conclude rather quickly. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. Um, so it is admirable. I understand the businessmen and I support them because, hey, you know, it's helping our economy. Um, but it will affect the children and families. Um, we have, Waikiki doesn't have to be a model because we have models from other cities already. Thank and you. it shows that it doesn't work. Um, Thank you very much. That's the evidence. <laughs> Thank you. Folks, I am doing my best to be liberal with the time limit, but when you hear the buzzer go off, please start to conclude your testimony. I, we can't have folks going on for three and four and five minutes. I'm doing my best to be as liberal as possible, and we do have another committee that is scheduled to start at 1 p.m. So again, when you hear the buzzer go off, that's an indication that your time is finished, and please do start to wrap up. The next testifier is Isaiah Chong, followed by Kahu Kaleo Patterson, followed by Richard Salvador. Isaiah Chung, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, board members. I was here at the last hearing for these bills when they were first brought forward. I'm pretty much going to talk to you as I did before. Think of it this way. What if it was you, personally, in this situation? You know, everyone 
within the last two months or so, I've been taking the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. Why have a challenge for each member today? Why don't you give up your pension, your salaries? You have no income to pay for your mortgage. What would you do? Where would you end up? Think about it. Board members, we have to think of it as Hawaii, trade winds, sunshine. This does not only affect people who are homeless. We have to think, are we affecting those who literally sit on sidewalks or those who are campaigning for office, whose supporters are opening folding chairs on the sidewalk? Do we make exemptions for those who are running for office, those who can afford to do so? All I ask is that each and every one of you think about what you would expect if it was yourself or your family member in this situation. We should never, ever expect those who are less fortunate than us to be put in a hard situation than made even worse. Shelter situations are difficult. We need to do the best thing. And telling people get off the sidewalks and go on the road, that's not the best thing. Get off the sidewalks and jump in the river, that's not the best thing. You cannot say go somewhere without offering a proper alternative. Where do we as a community go when you all go home? Think about Thank it. Thank you. Mahalo Nui Loa, Mr. Chair. Members, any questions? Thank you. Kahu Kaleo Patterson. Richard Salvador. Followed by Jason Espero. Aloha, Ikaika Anderson, Mr. Anderson, and the council members. My name is Richard Salvador, and I, uh, I'm an English teacher at McKinley Community School, and I also work for the uh, Pacific Justice and Reconciliation Center. So, Kahu Kaleo Patterson is my uh, boss, and uh, his testimony is, on, is in opposition as well. So, I, I come here to, uh, to say, uh, in contrast to the uh, person from Waikiki, that uh, when she talks about Hawaii not having the legal foundations and the legal history that preceded the Wild West. I, I, I submitted my testimony, but I began by putting down, quoting the, uh, the old law, uh, the law of the uh, splinter paddle, Kanawai, Kanawai Mama Lahoe, 1797, which uh, I have the uh, Hawaiian that I will not read, but uh, quickly the English translation is, O people, Honor thy God, respect alike the rights of people both great and humble. May everyone from the old men and women to the children be free to go forth and lie in the road, by the roadside or pathway, without fear of harm, break this law and die. Now, I don't know what that, mean, that last line means, but uh, there is a history of legal tradition that precedes even the Wild West, and for somebody to come and say that Hawaii does not have those those legal foundations is untrue and it denigrates the people and the culture of this, of this land. I come originally from uh, Pacific Island nation of Palau, but I've lived here for 26 years. And uh, uh, I think that while these three, the, the bill is 42, 45, and I think 48, uh, while I recognize the need to address imminent dangers posed by people lying or sitting on sidewalks, I think the deeper issue has uh, touched us on the, uh, the ancient law that uh, was taken by the Hawaii Constitution and extended to us through the generations. So we have a uh, historical basis for extending uh, generosity and compassion to people who are, who are most vulnerable. Uh, so I, I urge you to not pass the law uh, and, and, and uh, criminalize something that emerges out of the pervasive issue of homelessness. Thank you. Mahalo. Members, any questions? Thank you. Jason Espero, followed by Haheo Gonson, followed by Bart Deem. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Chair Anderson, Council members. My name is Jason Espero. I work at Waikiki Health. I'm the director of Caravan. The last three years, I was the manager at Next Step Shelter, so I know what's going on there. Uh, we just want to provide some comments uh, about these bills. We see these bills as mainly a proposal to the problem of homelessness, and our concerns are, what's the end plan? Uh, and we, and you know, I'll echo what a lot of people 
have said about the solution, really the solution is permanent, affordable housing. And, and with, uh, you know, we're happy to hear that at least one bathroom is, is gonna stay open in Waikiki. <laughs> Um, but what happens if you're on the diamond head end of Kalakau and when nature calls, are you, you know, are you going to make it to the substation restroom? So if you could consider opening up uh, the other restrooms as well. Um, in regards to the fees at Next Step, ID, splitting of families, we do not split families. Uh, we do not require IDs uh, for admission requirements into our shelter. Uh, we do have fees. It's $60, $65, $70 and $80, but if you are unable to provide your program fees, we will waive it. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, I can answer it for you. Thank you, Mr. Sparrow. Members, any questions? Thank you. Ha'aheo Gonson, followed by Bart Dame, followed by Teresa Cantero. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you very much for your hard work and efforts. I am, um, in opposition to this, um, to these bills, my name is Ha'aheo Guanson, and I am with the Pacific Justice and Reconciliation Center. For many years, our organization has been working with um, those who are marginalized and working for the education of people to understand what is going on. As was mentioned, people really do not want to live on the sidewalks or do um, have to be on the streets, as was mentioned by the managing director. So we're asking for really permanent solutions. We're looking for things that are going to resolve the issue, not just a Band-Aid or what the systemic, what's just right there. So we are very concerned that we take a compassionate view of how to really deal with these people who are oftentimes working and with children. And so our organization really urges you to please um, oppose this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members, any questions? Kindness. If not, Bart Dean, followed by Teresa Cantero, followed by Kimor Carvalho. Aloha, members. Um, I have uh, a chart here which I think is useful. I'm sorry I didn't submit it in advance. Um, this comes from the 16-page document that the Appleseed Center had produced on the housing crisis in Hawaii. I think it's a very useful uh, document. I'm sure you've all read it. Um, let me express an unusual amount of humility as I start off because I haven't had the time to really immerse myself in, in the com complex issues of, of homelessness uh, to the extent that you folks have and some of the agencies that are here testifying. So I'm trying to sort through the issue and figure it out. And this chart, which I handed out, um, for those who haven't seen it, it shows the disparity in the climbing cost of housing in Hawaii versus the basically stagnant or slowly growing, not even keeping up with inflation, growth in wages, the earnings of people. This is the context in which we have to talk about homelessness. Yes, there are homeless people who have been deinstitutionalized and who have been broken. There are people who have mental illness, who have alcohol abuse. These are the most vulnerable members among us. They're the canaries in the coal mine, though. If you plot these chart, this chart with the different graphs towards the future, more and more of us are going to be homeless until we solve the problem of houselessness. I'm glad to, to see that we've settled upon this, this slogan or this approach, uh, housing first. So if that's our serious intent, why are we going law enforcement first? Why are we waiting for the managing director to hopefully have a program that starts in three months from now, but it's not sure how big it is, uh, before we start going to the law enforcement approach. So I would ask you to defer these bills, not pass these bills out, and let's put our minds together and our hearts together and see what we can do for our people. Thank you. Thank you. M members, any questions for Mr. Dean? Thank you. Teresa Cantero, followed by Kimo Carvalho, followed by Asina Clauser. Uh, hello, committee members. Um, I'm speaking to you today as a resident in Waikiki and a student at UH Manoa, and I would just like to say that I strongly oppose these bills. Um, I recently wrote a satirical paper on the issue of homelessness, suggesting that we should round up the homeless and send them by force to a different location just to get them out of sight. 
And even though my paper was satirical, it was shocking to me how many people in my class agreed that this was a necessary step to end this issue. It is not, and that is exactly what this bill sounds like to me. You are rounding up and criminalizing people for sitting and sleeping. You're going to cite people who have no means to pay and send them when, and try to move them when they have nowhere else to go. This will no doubt clog up our justice system. This will no doubt cost taxpayers more money than what we as a state can really contribute. In conclusion, the last report said that it'll cost about $15,000 and that's what the state is paying for these sweeps of the homeless. That is what the state is putting out. And that equals about $2 million a year. Couldn't we put that money more towards the housing first? Couldn't we put that money more towards rehabilitating the shelters that we already have when there are known cockroach infestations, rat infestations, bed bug infestations? Next Step Shelter in 2012 had a leaky roof. Couldn't we try to put more of these funds more towards social services than trying to criminalize and pass this law that will, you have the studies that will prove that it is not effective and it will not work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Members, any questions? Thank you. Kimo Carvalho, followed by Sina Clauser, followed by David Cannell. Hello, Council Members. My name is Kimo Carvalho. I'm actually the Development and Community Relations Manager at IHS. Um, so actually, uh, I did submit testimony and I want to know, is it uh, I submitted our name on behalf of our team. Is this a good time to answer any other questions, or should we wait till everyone else goes first? Did you have anything else you'd like to add to what was already presented? Um, personally, I think the only thing I would like to add is that um, IHS has done this before. We've pleaded to, we've uh, responded to a plea for help once before in the North Shore of Oahu a couple years ago. And um, that was because of the increased homelessness and the complaints up there. And so we formulated an outreach team. And since then, we've actually seen uh, much success. Uh, probably about 251 individuals actually have moved off the streets. And of those that we have housed, about 90% are still actually housed. So our retention rate is really good. Um, we're actually just looking to do the same thing. We're looking to respond to a plea to help in Waikiki. And that's why we're here today. Um, I imagine there's a lot of questions related to the finances, um, and I heard some other uh, um, uh, items that you wanted to address, IHS in particular, so I think I'll kind of save that for our entire team, but for now, that's all I'll say personally. Members, any questions for Mr. Cavallo? Thank you very much. Sure. Sina Clauser, followed by David Cannell, followed by Joe Kelsey. Thank you, Council Chair and members. I'm Sina Clauser. I'm a resident of Waikiki. Um, I stayed in IHS for one year. And I would like to tell people what IHS offers. IHS offers uh, bed bugs, we know. <laughs> Not fumigation, if we understand the word correctly. I don't think the director does. Um, IHS offers uh, the, uh, the uh, mandate that you never call the ambulance. If you see a friend have a grand mal seizure on the premises, if you see a friend overdose, if you know that a person has taken all of her Vicodin and has told you so, we are to wait for staff to call. And on one occasion, I believe one of our friend's lives was saved because the staff thought if her liver wasn't working, she would not be able to talk or semi-walk. And the women saved her life. And I was there a year, and I, these women, drug addicted, sex workers, whatever they had to do to survive, parolees on probation, I, my hat is off to all of them. But you do not go through this experience unscathed. I mean, I, I don't sleep through the night. I don't want my worst enemy to stay there. The first principle of ethics is first do no harm. They have failed. Why, are, why, are, why is this institution which lies to the public about IDs, about um, verification of homeless letters that you need through a, a certain social work agency, you don't just show up there and get in. I got in my second time, second attempt a year later. I, I think there's just distrust between the members and the residents of IHS because they are not forthcoming. 
and you have to play the game, and every single rule is broken. This idea that what doesn't happen on the streets doesn't happen at IHS is completely false. Prescription pills, I was so green, I never seen, had seen it before. Pills are sold, bought, and traded on premises every day. I've seen women and friends do sex work mm -hmm. to pay their fees. Good point, IHS, if they can get, um, you know, to pay their fees, if, if they can, you know, do sex work for drugs, they might as well do sex work for, for fees, but that's what I'm calling it. Because I saw it, I, I gave a friend some money and I would do it again because she was going to be kicked out and she was on probation. And violating the rules of um, probation would mean that if, if she had been exited, she would have been back to, to jail or prison. So um, I've seen suicide attempts. It is, it is a place where people are in despair. It is a place where people who are severely mentally ill and drug addicted and active in their lifestyles are mixed with children. There are people who the staff had to bathe, who had issues of blood. It's not uncommon to sit on premises or to stand on urine or blood and have to tell the staff, this is a biohazard. Hep C is pretty um, alive even after three weeks. And a lot of the staff were so great and were so wonderful and I don't think they're paid enough, but I have no patience for people. I have no patience for, for the officials because it's, 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 it's misleading. And I don't think they meet the bar of first doing no harm. I don't think they can take care of the ones that they've already got in their housing. And I did not get out through their services, by the way. I, I actually think most don't. Thank you. Members, any questions? Thank you very much. Right. David Cannon, followed by Joe Kelsey, followed by Tabitha Martin. Thank you, members of the council. Uh, um, you know, it, it really saddens me because I, I, I have a daughter and a son that went through uh, UH, and um, they're, they're in their late 20s now, and they're, they were born and raised here in Hawaii, and they're, they're really thinking they can't, I mean, they're, they're this close to being homeless. And they're, they're figuring that, you know, we're, I'm going to have to leave the islands, you know. And there's, uh, there's so many folks who are doing this. And, and see, th this is policy um, uh, that hasn't, uh, I mean, you folks in the political arena have known for years that, that there's this huge demand for affordable housing. But nothing much happens. And um, um, I, I, I handed you folks out this handout. And here's a really simple idea, a, a toilet. <laughs> Put toilets around and no doo-doo or shishi. And um, what we have is a moral crisis. Really, it's a political moral crisis. And it, it's really political malpractice that has allowed this situation of homelessness just just keep on going on and and getting getting worse and worse and worse every year it doesn't get it, by by 2014 we we should be to a point where it's it's going down but no it's going up and up and up you know and um what what what, what you got to do is start looking outside the box um, 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 housing first is is a lovely idea but you folks are going to have to make a huge commitment in, 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 in resources to make this really work. If you, if you really want to get folks off the streets and, 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 and into homes. And if you don't want to do that, you're going to have to have other um, um, way, ways to solve this problem. And there, there, there's a lot of alternatives. Um, uh, I have a friend that has been working constantly on... on, 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 on on container housing, which was for a fraction of the price. And, th and th there's, uh, Portland, Oregon has a dignity village, they call it. The, s the city of Portland donated s about five acres of land. These folks built their own little homes, their little, own little cabins on this. And, uh, and, and they, have their, they have gardens and they have chicken coops and goats and the whole works. I mean, that has even become a tourist attraction. We could even do that because th they actually have a souvenir shop. Uh, because and, and, and they get a lot of donations from um, just the, 
the general public. And there's micro um, apartments, and there's all kinds of things. I put my phone number on, on your, your thing. And any of you who want to, uh, me and my friend Don and other folks would be happy to give you some really good ideas because we, we've, been, we've been working on this a long time and we, we have been homeless. So we know, ask homeless folks, they, they know Carlo, how to I need to ask you to please sure, conclude I'll your testimony. Up. Anyway, uh, they, they, they have the resource. I mean, they know how to, um, uh, to they're very resourceful folks because we're, we're living on <laughs> close to nothing. And, and so we know how, we know how to make, and, and instead of spending, I mean, I think this last year, the state of Hawaii is going to spend a hundred million dollars on various homeless situations. But, 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 but I guarantee you, if you guys don't make a really big multi-year commitment with like Housing First and other programs, the, 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 the things are just going to keep on going like they are. Um, thank you for thank your... Thank you. Yeah. Members, any questions for Mr. Kelly? Joe Kelsey, followed by Tabitha Martin, followed by Shannon Martinez. I'd also like to uh, thank Councilmember Harimoto, the chair of the Transportation Committee, which was due to meet at 1 o'clock. Thank you very much, Councilmember Harimoto, for allowing us to conclude the Zoning and Planning Committee agenda without recessing. I appreciate it. All right. Please proceed. Uh, my name is Joe Kelso, and uh, I'd, like to thank for, I'd like to thank the council for allowing me to talk. I'm just going to keep it plain and simple. Mm -hmm. This past year, the Department of Labor released statistics showing that the state of Hawaii, for them to be above the poverty line, which is 30% of their annual income on housing, your average person has to work two full-time jobs to maintain a livable allowance to maintain above the poverty line. Most people have roommates. Most people don't have that. It's not hard to see why the homeless problem is rising. What I'm actually appalled that is the fact that there's a bill sitting in the city council chambers saying that because you don't have a place to go, because you don't have a place to stay, because you don't have a job, you're a criminal. That's what it does. That is the end result of all of this. Because these guys aren't going to find a place to stay anywhere else. That you can't magically make rooms for them to go to. They get warned, then they get cited, and then they go to jail. It's the end of it. You should do the right thing. You should not support this bill. But if you do vote yes on this bill, you need to think that you are telling every single homeless person in the state of, in this county, in this city, especially in the Waikiki region, you need to pretend that you're looking them in the face and telling them that they are a criminal and that they deserve to go to jail because that's the end result. Thank you. Members, any questions? Tabitha Martin followed by Shannon Martinez, followed by Tracy Martin. Hello, Chair, um, Council Members. Thank you for letting me speak. Okay, I'm just gonna be straight up. Has any of you ever experienced coming close to being homeless? or even thought or put yourselves in that predicament in your mind? Have you taken your minds to where the homeless people are, the homeless children are? If not, then honestly, you wouldn't have any idea what it would be like if all these children would be considered criminals because they sleep on sidewalks. My daughter. My daughter is a big, big, big inspiration to my husband and I, and she's the, she's the glue that keeps us together. I mean, these sweeps, confiscating our stuff, are the only things we have is not helping at all, straight up. We understand why there's sweeps, it's to beautify the community, garbage control, we understand that. But to confiscate our items, which Ross Sasamura, um, the director, had mentioned that there's no fee, they waive the fees or whatever for uh, necessities, you know? That's BS, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not true because 
before this year happened, they used to just throw everyone's stuff into that dump truck, into the rubbish truck, and it, you couldn't get it back because it's rubbish now. I have video of them destroying my items before placing them in the bins to take it to the storage. I'm not paying $200 for destroyed items that I bought. So I'm just asking you guys to reconsider passing this bill because it's not going to happen. Nothing is going to change this way. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions? Shannon Martinez, <coughs> followed by Tracy Martin, <coughs> followed by Jack Tonaki. Shannon Martinez. Okay. Tracy Martin, followed by Jack Tonaki, followed by Sierra Cummings. My name is Tracy Martin, and believe it or not, I'm homeless. You know, this bill that you guys have, not only criminalizing homelessness, it's making the homeless people animals of prey. We actually feel hunted by city and county, by sheriffs, by police. You know, it's, it's sad. I used to watch this on Mutual of Omaha, Wild Kingdom. You know, and now I'm living it. I'm looking over my shoulders all the time. You know, waking up every morning wondering if there's going to be a sweep. You know, this bill is crazy. It, like the guy said, it's unethical, it's demoralizing, it's all that. You know, you know, it, I watch people pass by every day. Um, Last I heard, you're supposed to give three feet, you know. We'll give four, make sure people can pass by, wheelchairs can go by.